things that I've done in my career, I think I have a really good perspective on this issue and can provide you with helpful information. So I want to give you some of my background that's relevant to the testimony. So I've worked and participated in Active 50 since 1995. Uh, from 1995 to 1999, 1999, I was the active 50 attorney for ANR, and that meant I got to go to every district commission around the state um, and um, argue before them and represent ANR and as well as other state agencies. And I also appeared before the former former environmental board on a number of occasions. I was the executive director of what was known as the Water Resources Board in 2003 when permit reform happened uh, in 2003 and then went into effect in 2004. So what that meant was that I was actually at the table and had a front row seat when the change was made to move the environmental uh, appeals from the environmental board to the court. So I was right there when it happened and part of what I want to do today is kind of convey what happened and why and what was sort of the thinking around it and what, what's changed since then. Um, since the court was uh, expanded to hear a and and Active 50 appeals, I've, I've been before the court on a number of occasions, both representing state agency, I was the a and general counsel, um, and uh, at VNRC representing citizen groups. So I've been before the court wearing multiple hats. Uh, in addition, I had the privilege of serving as the chair of the NRB during the Shulman administration, so for slightly over a year, I was administering the Active 50 program and saw how the NRB functioned in a post-environmental board world. So um, those are the different perspectives I've had on this. When I get to testify about a lot of things, I don't usually have had such direct experience with an issue. I hope that I can convey some of that to all of you today. Um, so I'm here today representing VNRC though, and so I want to be really clear that VNRC strongly supports moving back to a board model uh, for appeals. Um, we believe that eliminating the environmental board was a major mistake that has harmed the effectiveness of Act 250, and it's one of the most important improvements that this committee can make in your vital efforts to modernize Act 250. Um, there are a number of reasons why VNRC takes that position. I'm going to fold them out for you, and then I'm going to go for each reason. I don't know if you were you going to use the screen. I am going to use it, but not for a while. Okay. You could shut it off for well, or whatever, whatever Great. really works. So the, what I want to go over in terms of why VNRC supports returning to a board model, there are really three major reasons. Uh, we believe that moving appeals from the environmental board has hampered consistency in administering Act 250 and has weakened uh, the program generally. We believe that a board is a better fit to render decisions on the numerous technical criteria of Act 250. And we believe that a board process would be more nimble, less expensive, and more efficient for applicants and all parties uh, you know, concerned about the impacts of the projects. So I'll get to all of those points, but first I want to kind of you know walk you back to 2002 and kind of walk through like how did we get here? Like why did we make this change? Act 250 was enacted in 1970, and the Environmental Board was in place for 30 plus years. So what happened in 2002 that we got to a point where we we were considering and then ultimately made the change to move appeals from the Environmental Board to the court. So if you think back to 2002, I was 12 years old. That's a joke. That's a joke. Um, I was Governor Douglas's first term. He campaigned on a number of issues. Permit reform was one of the issues he campaigned on. And he made permit reform a top uh, priority on his legislative agenda. Um, shortly after uh, coming into office, he had his uh, agencies draft a permit reform bill that was really very wide in scope. It was not what came out at the end. The first version of the permit reform bill um, basically would have altered the permit system from soup to nuts. It would have changed how district commissions worked. It would have changed how zoning bodies worked. And also had a component to change um, the appeals process. Um, 
pretty much right away, the first uh, part of the biennium, there was really intense scrutiny of the soup to nuts overhaul of the permit process. And right away, there didn't seem to be a big appetite for changing the whole process. Much like I think what you've heard today, when we really, when the committees really got into it, what they heard was, you know, actually Act 250 works, you know, better than some of the systems. The district commission process seems to be in fairly good shape. There was more concern expressed about the zoning process, quite frankly, than there was about Act 250. People have routinely, and I think still to this day, routinely use Act 250 as sort of like nomenclature to mean any problem with the permit process, but when you really kind of got beneath the surface, you really realized it wasn't Act 250, and you realized that it wasn't the whole system that was so flawed that we had to change it radically. But what remained from that initial proposal was this um, idea that we should look at the appeals part of the process. So permit reform really became appeals reform because the other parts of it really fell to the wayside. Um, so why did people want to look at the appeals process after deciding that the rest of the system was working well enough to not do a major o overhaul? In my view, there are several factors that you're going to hear about today and over the course of your testimony because they're the same issues that are relevant to changing a system back from a court to a board. So one factor was um, the attorneys that practiced before the board, both the environmental board and the water resources board, were frustrated that there was not strict adherence to, um, to rules of evidence and procedures, and particularly that there wasn't the ability to go through what they call the discovery process. And I don't know how familiar you are with court proceedings, but the discovery process is in courts and in front of some professional boards. And, you know, when you file a complaint or an appeal, parties get to find out what the, what the real problem is. You get to submit questions to the parties to say, well, what is, why are you concerned about this? What's the basis of your concern? In Act 250 appeals, it, it usually involves expert testimony because we're dealing with pretty technical issues. So you get to say who are your experts and what do they believe and why do they believe it. That discovery process was not part of the Citizen Environmental Board, and it frustrated attorneys that they didn't have that information when they would go into a hearing to be able to test the evidence. Um, and, and as I said, there were other concerns about adherence to, to, to rules of evidence and procedure. Um, so another factor was the Environmental Board was a nine-member citizen board. So think about that. You're, you're, you're an advocate going in front of this board. There are nine people sitting that you need to convince to basically you know, adopt your argument, whatever it may be. There were some participants in that process that felt a nine-member board was a little bit unwieldy. Um, in particular, uh, I, I saw applicant lawyers and lawyers for agencies. It was a little unnerving. You had nine people. They could ask witnesses questions. Um, you know, when it came to board questioning time, you know, lawyers like to manage and have a control process, and I'm a lawyer, and I understand what that's about. You do a lot of work prepping for trial, and you had nine people from varied backgrounds. You had some lawyers, but you had business people, you could have farmers, you could have engineers, and you get questions from all these different perspectives from your witnesses, and, you know, all of a sudden your case was changing and right in front of your eyes. That doesn't happen. The court is a very controlled environment. You have your discovery process, you have one judge, who doesn't ask, he asks some questions, but certainly not like a nine-member citizen board would. So I think that there was some feeling that um, that was a change that people wanted to see. Um, thirdly, and this is fairly obvious, but the board had been around for 30 years and during that period of time had made decisions that had made everybody uh, in the state of Vermont at one time unhappy. So it made applicants unhappy with some decisions, it made citizens unhappy with some decisions, it made state agencies unhappy with some decisions, and so there was sort of an erosion of like, everybody was, you know, had something they could point to where they were like, well, maybe we should change this process, because it didn't work out for us in one particular case or, or another. And finally, and something that, you know, I, I'm sure that this committee will talk about, um, is there was a, a concern that there were multiple appeal rounds. So let me paint a picture of you of what the situation was in 2002. So in 2002, Act 250 appeals went to the Citizen Environmental Board. a &R water permits went to the Water Resources Board. There were other a &R permits, waste permits, some would go to a waste facility panel. Other permits, like air permits, I believe, went to Superior Court. Um, zoning permits went to Environmental Court. Um, so I think you get the picture. So there are all these permits going 
to different places, and there was a feeling that if we had them all go to the same place, there would be some inherent efficiency um, in doing that way, and it would take away some of the uncertainty. So that was certainly a factor. Um, so that begs the question, well, you know, how did we get to a court? Is the court the only way to really address those concerns? And the answer is no. And in fact, during most of 2002 and 2003, when what was left of the big permit reform bill had become appeal reform bill, was moving through the process, most of the talk was about creating a professional board. There was talk about going to the environmental court. There was talk about having a three-judge panel in the environmental court. But there was also talk about having some sort of a professional board that could provide more for some discovery, have somewhat tighter rules of procedure and evidence, um, but still not be as formal as a court. And we went up until really the very end of 2003, where I think, you know, and I was following this really closely, because mind you, the Water Resources Board was eliminated in all this. So my job, uh, I had staff that worked for me, their jobs, I, everybody was really on edge. It was the thing that we were most concerned about for these two years. It basically meant not only the existence of individual jobs, but people who believed in these institutions, right? Believed in the institution of the Water Resources Board, believed in the institution of the Environmental Board. And I, my estimation was things were leaning towards having some sort of a professional board. But at the very end, the compromise that was struck was that we would go to environmental court, and Governor Douglas really felt strongly about environmental court, but he also was pushing for changes to some of the Act 250 criteria, changes to how a &R permits interface with Act 250, and, um, um, and party status. So those were also on the table, and the deal was if those things come off the table, and in exchange, we'll go with your idea to go with the court. And that's really what happened at, at the very end. Now, when that happened, it was, uh, it was sort of an uneasy feeling. I, th I know that um, you know, people uh, in the environmental community, and, and we were immediately concerned that um, going to a court would be too formal of a process, that it would create uh, an expensive process, that going from a nine-member citizen board to one judge making decisions on the, the, the varied and myriad Act 50 criteria was a, was a huge shift, right? You're going from all the way the nine-member citizen board you're swinging to one judge. And we were concerned about what that would mean for the type of Act 50 decisions, not the results necessarily, but sort of the, the, sort of the substance of the decisions and would a court be able to provide the function that the environmental board did. And so I, in our estimation, those concerns have come to fruition, and that's why we're here today, basically, um, urging this committee to go back to some sort of a board model, and I'll go, I'll go through that. I want to say one other thing, just uh, for the record and the history of Act 250, which I kind of glossed over. Uh, a, a huge part of the discussion in 2002, 2003, was around who could appeal to the Supreme Court. I don't know if, you, if you've delved into this at all, but when Act 250 was you know, created, not all parties had the rights to appeal to the Supreme Court. Statutory parties had the right to appeal to the Supreme Court, and applicants had the right to appeal to the Supreme Court. And I think I got that right, but if I didn't, that's stand up, well, they'll let me know if I got it wrong. But citizen groups did not have the right to go to the Supreme Court, environmental groups didn't have the right to go to the Supreme Court. So that was a big part of the overall compromise. That change was made. There was some change to the party status standard, and, the, and then there was a change to all parties can now appeal to the Supreme Court. So I just want to be, be clear about that. With you should know that because it was you know part of the sort of historical change that happened um, in 2002, 2003, which really was significant. It was a significant event in the history of 1950. So stop there. I'm going to go into sort of like today and why I'm here today and what the reasons are that the NRC is advocating to go um, back to a board model, but just, uh, I'm happy to take some questions just on that part of it, or do you want me to keep folks have questions, moving? Representative Dolan. I, I would just like to um, <coughs> ask you that when you talk about the direction you'd like to see us go in, in terms of a board model, that you touch on the difference between this board model and the um, but the original nine-member board model. What has changed? What improvements have happened that would warrant us to look at this model? Just keep that yep. question. Sure, absolutely. So not hearing any other questions, I'm going to... Yes, sir. So 
Um, okay. this, after all you've said, it's basically what you're saying is that you would agree with um, this on line 16, page 2, replacing Natural Resources Board with a monitor on over your board. Yes. So after all you've said, that's what you mean. Yeah, I'm, I, I should be more concise, and, uh, and I apologize for that. I'm not, I'm just, it's, yes, definitely in favor of that, and I want to explain why. Thank you. But I also wanted to give you some of the history of kind of how we, how we got here, because I, I think it would be helpful. Anyway, so the first point is moving appeals from the Environmental Board has hampered consistency in Act 50 and weakened the administration of the program. Um, so until 2004, the Environmental Board, through its decision on appeals, was able to address questions about how various criteria should be interpreted and implemented. The clarity and depth of Environmental Board decisions was able to communicate to district commissions and applicants to all parties to Act 250, basically how Act 250 worked. So I want to give you an example of this. So take, for example, the aesthetic criterion of Act 250. Uh, under the Act 250 statute, um, the statute says that to obtain a permit, an applicant may not have an undue adverse effect on aesthetics, period. That's part of criterion A. All the statute says. There's nothing more in it. So that raises the question, so how should a district commission judge what is an undue adverse effect on aesthetics? What does it mean to have an undue adverse effect on aesthetics? And you know, during the, um, the early part of Act 250, issues started to be raised at district commissions, appeals, got to the Environmental Board, does this project violate Criterion 8? And so to answer this question, the board had to create a test. Um, and they created a test, and um, it's known famously as the Queechee analysis. I don't know how many of you have heard of the, 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 the term the Queechee analysis. So it comes from this case in residential development in Queechee, Vermont. So the board broke this down and said, well, first we're going to look at what's adverse, and then we'll look at what's undue. They decided, based on the help of, uh, I believe, experts that they were able to consult with in the open hearing process, um, that whether something fits into the context of its surroundings is the first step to see if something's adverse. And the answer to that question was yes. They created uh, a test for undue that involved does a project violate a clear community standard? Is it shocking and offensive to the average person? And if those questions were answered in the affirmative, could it be mitigated? And it set forth different ways to mitigate. Now my point in going through this is not to have you know the Quichi analysis, but it's to basically try to give an example of you know, what the board did to create clarity and consistency in Act 50 decision. It took one line in Act 50 Products will not have an undue adverse effect on aesthetics, and then created this very reasoned test that is held up in the Supreme Court, that is used to this day, um, you know, by applicants. They know what they have to do. They know how to meet the test. District commissions know how to apply the test. Um, and this is the type of decision that boards are really well suited to creating, where courts are not. Courts are basically the nine-member citizen panel was well suited with lots of different minds from lots of different perspectives to kind of break down this issue. How are we going to take this one line of statute and bring it to life and make something you know reasonable out of it that people can follow and will protect the values in Vermont that we want Act 50 to protect. Courts really are not set up to do that. Courts are more set up to hearing from experts about this and that, kind of voting up and down about who they believe, but not really creating these sort of you know, technical tests for dealing with issues. And that's what I think is a main thing we've lost in going to the court. Um, these tests that were, I think one of the things that have made the court work to the ex its extent that it has to this point is that in the 2003 legislation, the legislature says that the court needs to follow board precedent. So all the board precedent on issues like the Quichi analysis the court has to follow, and that has kind of kept us on at least some bit of a track because we have a number of tests in the law, like the Quichi analysis. But you know, there are different facts and cases that come across all the time. These tests are not static; they need to evolve with the different issues that are before them. There are new issues that, that were not decided by the board that 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 deserve clarity, and um, that is just something that we really lost with the with the court system, and it's not you know, court, bad, board, good. It's that what is the best fit for what we're trying to do 
with the mix of technical and legal issues in Act 250. Um, I don't know that I want to, I mean, I could, I, what I wanted to pull up here, and maybe if we have time, we can go back to it, but uh, have you guys looked at the E-Note Index? Do you yes. know what the E-Note Index is? So, um, so the E-Note Index is basically an electronic recitation of all the major decisions in Act 250. And um, I don't really know how to make this work, but just kind of click on it. Or? Just want to open that link a little. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there it is. Um, so this, I just wanted to show you, and, I, and, and you know, in your own leisure, if you're as uh, if you're as sadistic as I am, you just go through this. I mean, look at all of the the different issues. Each of these little links is an issue that the environmental board created precedent on. Some of these issues you talked about, above 2,500 feet. What does that mean? That's something that the environmental board rendered a decision on to clarify in a particular case how that applied. All these different jurisdictional issues. Um, you get down to some of the criteria. But you can just see, I just want you to kind of get a sense of just the, the vast amount of issues. And really, these are all still linking to environmental board and then Vermont Supreme Court decisions on environmental board cases. Um, but I wanted to, I just want to get down to the criteria themselves. And um, so the criteria, you can see, you know, the board has fleshed out what is air pollution. Oh, it could be noise, it could be dust. That was not a given. That all came from board decisions. Well, how do you determine how much is too much of noise or dust? There's a whole host of water pollution decisions. But I think some of the best examples are really, if you get into the, the nines, uh, which deal with community impacts, um, there are issues like existing cells, cost of scattered development. The criteria says that uh, if something, if a, if a project constitutes scattered development, that you have to do some environmental weighing, and scattered development determines whether you're outside an existing settlement. These were undefined terms. What does that mean? Um, you know, the board went and had to define these terms in a really technical way. Um, and, you know, maybe this will come up, maybe it won't. But I just want you to, maybe you should look at that at some point. Um, because it's creating these tests that I just don't think a court is really, here's the definition of existing settlement, you can see it there, that's not in the statute. That's not something that's in the statute. It's something that the board, that I think not just one judge, not just a lawyer, but those principles are not legal principles, they're really planning principles, they're land use principle, and they're just, you know, literally, dozens and dozens of issues like this that the board had opined on that really set the framework for Act 250, told the district commissions kind of how to interpret the law, how to implement the law, told the applicants what to do, and I just feel we've lost that. We're not, you know, the courts is not set up to make these decisions. Yes. We have a question, actually, Dolan, and then... Um, my question is, uh, I know we got a little bit into um, this tool, so thank you for that. But like, my question is, when you have one-liners, such as the ones you, you um, described, is it helpful for legislation to direct the, the use of a um, rulemaking process to be able to tackle some of those um, those technical challenges that have that we see before us today, such as um, greenhouse gas um, avoidance, minimization, or um, um, mitigation. That's an example of another, a newer one-liner. Um, and what we were thinking about prior to the break is some sort of process by which the board would wrestle with these issues. And so I guess my question is, is it adequate enough to be silent about the process to be able to develop the that technical guidance on how to address those challenges? Or is it, would it, in your mind, be 
um, I think, more uh, robust and more responsible on our part to be able to direct the, the use of rulemaking to try to tackle some of those challenges that, that bring with it that public process to be able to evaluate um, the how to best implement something like a um, the model that's used for other impacts, such as primary soils, for example, but applying to greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the answer is it's a mix. I think that, and this really good, leads me to a couple of my, my next points. So I think that um, the theory was in moving appeals to the court and, and knowing that we were going to lose this, sort of these sort of substantive decisions, that the board could engage in rulemaking. I think that in some cases, if the legislature is making a change, it is appropriate to require rulemaking. I think it's a, a really case-by-case -case basis. I don't think you could require rulemaking and guidance for everything, though. You know, there are going to be little quirks and facts, and things are going to come up. And even if you have a rule, it won't answer all the questions, and you still need a tribunal to uh, you know, basically flesh out what that really means. But yes, I do think that sitting here um, and, you know, 2019, as opposed to 1970, when Act 250 was written, that we can be discerning about what's appropriate for rulemaking and guidance. And I think sometimes, you know, you can certainly address issues in that way. I think that in 2002, 2003, there was an over reliance on the idea that rulemaking could substitute for all of the type of sort of guidance that came out of these decisions. And there have been some. Um, attempts of rulemaking by the board to clarify a couple of issues, but having administered the Act 250 program and, and knowing you know, your, you know, your role at a and and knowing how government works, the rulemaking process is not for the faint of heart. It, it's, a, it's a minimum nine month process, usually longer than that, that um, you know, is cumbersome to get through. So I think in some issues where you know you really, the legislation really knows that it wants to do something, but it wants the, an agency to kind of put the technical meat on the bones is great. But when issues come up, the, the ability of a tribunal to more nimbly kind of look at the facts and kind of issue a ruling that really kind of addresses, tells the, the applicants and the parties and the district commissions kind of how we're going to handle things. I think you want both tools, basically. But yes, I would definitely encourage you as we go through the bill to look at opportunities for rulemaking and, and technical guidance. Um, and I think, like I said, I think in 2002, 2003, there was sort of an over-reliance on that rulemaking could just kind of cover. I think we knew we were going to lose something, and that's why that, that idea was there. But I, I just don't think that it's, it's, it's really completely done it. I think another issue that people thought you know, might help fill the gap in the kind of the change was that there would be more ability for lawyers at the NRB to provide advice to the di district commissions. Um, there had been a debate in Act 250, you know, forever about can lawyers for the board provide advice to district commissions because they also work for the board. And there was uh, a feeling that well, if the board's not hearing appeals, that frees up the lawyers to provide that advice. Um, and that is true, and that and there is a benefit to that. But the, it's not a substitute in my mind for the, board, the power of the board to be able to render these decisions for a couple of reasons. One is that advice is just advice. It's not basically you know, saying this is how things work. It's basically the lawyer's job is to provide sort of options about how to interpret the statute. And the district commission makes the decision. And then if, if the matter is appealed, then the NRB is a party. And once again, they don't have the authority. They're arguing they're one party in the court saying kind of this is how we look at this thing. But it, it's really up to the court to ultimately decide what to write in the decisions, and I can tell you from experience that the court has not just adopted what the NRB has recommended and kind of written out uh, decisions in a way that the old environmental board uh, used to used to write them. Um, and I would point out that there was, under the old environmental board, the best of both worlds. There was. Uh, uh, an attorney often walled off from an appeal who was able to provide advice to district commissions if they wanted it. So they're not mutually exclusive. You can certainly still have that. But I think rulemaking and advice provision from the board were like the type of tools that the legislature was envisioning would hope kind of fill the gap. And I do think that as rulemaking has a role, but I, I think you know you want it's not as sufficient as a tool. So 
we have to be aware of the time. Yes. We have to have one out of town guest and he's listed last. So yeah. I want to make sure that yeah. he has a chance. I'll go fast. That answered my question. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, um, Representative McCullough, is it quick? I, I got a quick question and I'll and I'll um great representative does a quick answer. Line seventeen um, through nineteen, page thirteen. The structure membership, including whether to be professional or semi-professional, and whether to have all group members to be determined. Do you have a recommendation now? It used to be nine. Should it be three? Um, should it be pro, semi-pros? Uh, uh, what, what, what should it be? So, yeah, shortly. I mean, I, you know, I, I've been, I, I think a professional, a professional board would work best. I'm retired. Oh, wow, grab your folders. Try to have, you know try to include um, some non-professional membership. I'm interested in hearing the debate. You know, honestly, I'm not saying I know the exact answer on that, quite frankly. But my vision was always what we talked about in 2002-2003 was having a professional board where you'd have a chair that was full time and two other members um, at least that were um, part time, so they could put in the time. You know, sort of like the Public Utility Commission does. Um, but I'm certainly open, and I think the NRC is open to uh, other ways to, to do it. I heard the testimony at the commission for the future of Act 250 and the desire to have a broader membership. I think you can do it that way. But I've always envisioned it as a three-member uh, you know, member board. Um, there's a bill I want to send you uh, after I testify today um, from 2012 that was sponsored by Representative Dean and, and Representative Dean Klein that created a professional board. And just as an example, and just to show you, like, and it was based on, I think, some of the bills back in 2003 that were floating around about a professional board. So, I mean, that's just my well, know, we'll, feeling. We we'll want to see that and, and maybe get get some more airtime on that. And yeah, and I think you should hear from moving on. Yeah, you should hear from other people, and you're going to get a variety yeah. of opinions yeah. on that. Um, I do want to say, the last thing on this is that, you know, I think that this effort you're undertaking is really important, and I think we, you know, having worked around activity, it's really important to modernize the law to make it work for monitors and address the issues we want today. And as we make changes, it's going to be more important to have a board back in place to do the type of work that the board did in the early days of Act 50 because we're going to be making these changes, and Representative Dolan's point is a good one, that you could have guidance and rules uh, you know, as part of one tool in the toolbox, but I, I think you're going to we're going to see sort of a, a revival of the need to basically have these issues fleshed out. Um, so really, the last points are quicker. So I think the NRC believes the board is a better fit to render decisions on technical criteria of Act 50, um, and that it can be more nimble and more efficient. So as I showed you by going through the keynote index. You know, and as I already stated, activity is a mix of law and technical issues. There's a lot in there, and it's just not the right fit to have one judge trying to interpret all of these mixed issues, whether they're land use, whether they're air, water, waste issues, whether they're wildlife issues, threatened endangered species issues. There's this inherent mix of technical issues and legal issues, which uh, I think a board is a better fit for. I think a board could be more efficient and less costly process for everybody. I can tell you, having participated in the environmental board and the environmental court, neither process was easy, but certainly the court process is very expensive. Like I said, it's really expert testimony heavy. Experts are very expensive. I participated in a two-week trial. I participated in a three-week trial as a nonprofit when I, or representing citizens. The costs go up very quickly, and it's very hard to keep up. And having an adjudicative board that has a little bit more flexibility, that has its own expertise because it's, it's a professional board, so you don't have to spend as much time on some of the foundational issues that come up. They have staff that are able to assist them. The, the, the court right now basically has access to a law clerk to deal with these technical and legal issues. So I think that the process could be cheaper and it could be more efficient. <coughs> I think you could have hearing officers use, like the Public Utility Commission uses, for, for, for less complex cases. Right now, whether it's a zoning fight about uh, a setback from a fence, or it's uh, about Walmart and, you know, going up in a town, it's the, you get the same process. You gotta go before the judge, you gotta go through the same process. I think some of these matters do lend themselves um, to the use of hearing officers. Um, and I think that, it could be more efficient. Um, two things 
quickly. One is that concerns that I've heard about going to a board model, one concern is that we want to preserve the independence of the board and the integrity of the decisions and not have a political decision making process. And the NRC supports that. I can't imagine there's a single solitary person in the entire state who does not want those things. And you know, judges go through judicial nominating process, so it's not that the governor just gets to choose whoever they want. Uh, they have to get a list of names from a judicial nominating committee. We would certainly be in favor of using a process like that, um, you know, for this new board. Um, I, I don't agree that the old environmental board was, you know, making political decisions. But to the extent that people are concerned about that, we we'll, everybody wants integrity and independence. And so, whatever you could do to write into the statute a fair nominating process and independence, I think, you know, we would support. And as I said, I would be find it difficult to believe that everybody would support that. Lastly, going back to the issue of consolidation that I mentioned. So that issue is not gone. I, you know, it came up during the commission on the future of Act 50 process, um, and it was one of the factors raised in 2002, 2003. I do not believe that consolidation is inherently efficient. Um, it makes trials, you know, if you have a zoning permit, an Act 15, an ANR permit, all addressing stormwater, and you wait to consolidate them, you have to often wait for the permits to catch up to each other. So you get delays where during those delay times you could just be dealing with some of those issues. There are different legal standards for all those issues, so the decision needs to account for that and the evidence needs to account for that. It, it makes, if you do consolidate, you're going to be guaranteed to have a longer trial and long trials are costly. As I said, you have your experts sitting there, being there. Um, so I do not agree that consolidation inherently creates efficiencies. I heard the testimony from the DPA, and I talked with Alex afterwards. Um, so that's kind of my, my view on that. But understanding that it's an issue, the, the Dean Klein bill does allow for consolidation. You're talking about consolidation of appeals is so important. Like this consolidation of, uh, of, of ANR and, yeah. and even zoning permits which is what we did with the environmental court. So we consolidated all those appeals groups. You could do that with a professional board. There were bills floating around in 2002 and three. who did that. The Dean Klein bill does that. And I'll just submit it to you and you can look at that. I'm not advocating for that, but I just know it's an issue and I want to acknowledge it. But you can deal with it within the professional board context. So right. Right. I've said a lot and uh, so a lot of time, but you know, I have flashbacks when I talk about this stuff, so. And this is like therapy for me, so I appreciate it. I don't know who to send the bill to. But, uh, so that's Representative McCall. Yeah, there we go. All right. So, All right any other questions, John. or? We'll hold our questions so we I will submit them after that. I didn't quite Great. make them totally ready for prime time. So. Okay, thanks. Well, for purpose of introduction, my name is Ed Stanick. I reside in Barry City, and I was employed by the uh, Act 250 program for 32 years as a district coordinator, mostly in District 5, Washington and Memorial counties, but also experiencing all the other eight districts uh, throughout the state. Uh, I'm here as Citizen Stanick. Um, I firmly believe the taxpayers of Vermont paid my salary for years, and all that training and expertise uh, should be returned to the public in terms of assisting in whatever way I can in interpreting the law of the case law and maybe where we go from here. Uh, I'm not employed or working for any organization. I'm strictly here on my own. Uh, and I've, I'm here specifically to assist in the process to determine what is the best system and entity for the administration of Act 250 and the appellate reviews going forward in the 21st century given the land uses and the impacts on the ecosystem that we're going to face. What's the best possible way of dealing with that? Uh, I submit that the Vermont experience shows that it can be done by a citizen board. In fact, it has been done, had been done successfully for 35 years by the Environmental Board. And in fact, and I haven't done a lot of research on this yet, I've been poking around in other states to see if there's something similar to citizen appellate boards. Certainly there's nothing similar to Act 250. Some have said over the years that the California Coastal Commission's similar to Act 250. Some have said that Hawaii and Maine have something similar to Act 250, but really not true. Act 250 is extremely comprehensive. But having said that, I note that Oregon has a land use uh, appellate board consisting of, uh, that's not judicial. 
Uh, it consists of three attorneys, and they hear the appeals of land use decisions. Uh, I also uh, saw, and I haven't really done more research on this, that Utah has a, a citizen appellate board, and also so too does Florida, which kind of raised my eyebrows having been to Florida. I wasn't aware they had any land use laws. <laughs> Um, so having said that, um, John gave you a lot of good information about the environmental board itself. Uh, nine members of the community, board tour section, um, quasi-judicial, and they also administered the programs, gave direction to the staff, uh, and they in, in, uh, undertook rulemaking. But I want to uh, reinforce the point that the citizen board somehow, uh, even though they were not judges, uh, really wrestled with some very difficult issues. Uh, and came up with great decisions which have been sustained. The emphasis, of course, I feel was on fact-based decision-making, not getting tied up in process or procedure. Uh, so when they had to decide water pollution or erosion, it was very, very facts, uh, uh, feet on the ground, looking at the actual tract of land and the impacts. But they did not ignore process. They understood due process. They understood property rights were involved. So I just wanted to cite two examples of landmark decisions. John touched on one already, the Quichi Lakes decision. You know, to put that in a context, uh, it was the late 1980s, and there was this thing called aesthetics, and everybody thought, boy, that's awfully touchy-feely. Touchy uh, it's too subjective. It's unconstitutional. Uh, beauty's in the eyes of the beholder. A lot of this was seething at the same time as, as people of Vermont liked the mountains, liked those open pastures and all. But how do you come up with the decision? John pointed out the bar, the, the environmental board, uh, retained some experts and carved out what we call the Queechee Lakes um, protocol. But I want to reinforce the point that this was appealed. That was appealed uh, by the corporation, Queechee Lakes Corporation, which, by the way, was an as-built review, so the environmental board had the benefit of seeing the condominiums on the hillside. <laughs> uh, not typical Act 250 practice. But the case went to the Vermont Supreme Court, and the Vermont Supreme Court, based upon uh, the sterling fact uh, finding done by the environmental board and its interpretation of the law, the Vermont Supreme Court affirmed the environmental board's decision on aesthetics, and that's now carved in stone in Vermont that we can review aesthetics. There are some similar decisions on the federal level. I think the most famous one is the U.S. Supreme Court decision involving Grand Central train station, but that was more historic preservation than the more comprehensive review on aesthetics being a legitimate land use review in Vermont, thanks to the environmental board, thanks to Queechee Lakes. And the second example, uh, which uh, which I think is important, affects Criterion 8A, uh, which deals with uh, wildlife habitat, necessary wildlife habitat. Again, to put this in context, um, the, uh, the case I'm about to refer to called the Southview decision played out in southern Vermont, and it was a deer yard case. And what was going on nationwide at that time, well, a lot of cases were going to the United States Supreme Court involving land use cases that said, this type of environmental regulation, land use control, it was argued constituted the taking of private property, and there had to be compensation paid similar to eminent domain. We cannot just overregulate, and this was hand-to-hand -hand combat going on in this era. So in that context appeared the South View decision for the deer yard down in southern Vermont, and it wove its way through the process. But again, most importantly was the environmental board, because the environmental board did the fact-finding which set the stage for the inevitable legal appeals that follow. And the legal appeals went not only to the Vermont Supreme Court, but into the federal system. Not too many Act 250 cases go into the federal courts. This one did. And it went to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals down in New York City. Some legal commentators will point out that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals is, is uh, second only to the United States Supreme Court, at least in its decisions on financial matters and others. But the point is this, that the Southview decision was upheld by the Second Circuit. Why? Because the environmental board did sound fact finding. All the courts will yield uh, to, the, they will give great deference to the administrative body as long as there is adequate fact finding. And my point is the environmental board, nine citizens managed to do that in these two cases, and there are others. So what are the problems with the current natural resources board? I'm here to testify not only about appeals, but about the administration of the program. And I want to hasten to add that uh, you know, I, I have great uh, respect for former Senator Diane Snelling, and none of my comments are directed personally against anybody in the program. They are objective, uh, and I'll try and be as diplomatic as possible. Uh, but it's about the administration of the program and, as a result of permit reform uh, back in 2002. First, I feel there's an inherent conflict under the current system. 
uh, as to the, uh, the powers and the role of the Natural Resources Board. Um, yes, it's good to have assistance of district commissions and district court is making their decisions. Um, but I think there's an inherent conflict when the Natural Resources Board, which is providing that assistance, some would say in a dark manner, trying to influence the decisions, that same Natural Resources Board turns around under 10 DSA 6027J, and they're a party, possibly, to appealing that same decision. My point is this, that it doesn't look good that an entity which is having a role in the decision of the District Commission quasi judicial panel then surfaces as a party on a level playing field with, let's say, the neighbors or the municipality and someone else that's an appellant uh, before the judicial, uh, before the environmental court. So that's a concern, inherent conflicts in those, wearing those two different hats currently. John already pointed out uh, that there was assistance back in the days of the environmental board, but there was a huge wall. There was a huge, solid wall um, between the district commission process and the environmental board process. Uh, the environmental board was the appellate body. The second problem is, uh, how does the natural resources board determine which cases it's going to participate as a party on appeal? Um, some of us have asked for years now, is there a policy or a procedure which indicates which of those cases, either jurisdictional questions by coordinators or substantive appeals of commission decisions, how does the NRB decide which of these cases they're going to appeal? Does the NRB presume that the commissions and the coordinators are reaching correct decision before it files an appeal? My point here is that there really isn't any policy or procedure so the public can become aware now as to how the NRB decides which cases they're going to participate as a party. And I checked, and I still can't find it on the website, so I think I'm correct in saying no policy, no procedure. Uh, some of us feel there's over-enthusiastic overuse of the minor application process and the administrative amendment process to approve projects which might otherwise benefit from having a hearing. And it's important to note that the public participation of Act 250 really only takes place if an application goes to a hearing before the district commission. That's the form when the neighbors show up and ask their questions and express their concerns. If there is no hearing, there really is no public participation. Yes, the rules say if a project is, is commenced as a minor application, you get request a hearing. Yeah, but my experience was uh, most people are very reluctant to make that request. They, want, they don't want to come across as causing trouble for their neighbor that wants to build something. Uh, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't trust government. But the flip side was equally true. They would come to a hearing if the process itself scheduled the hearing. So administrative amendments is the second category. The first category was minors. Administrative amendments were meant really, if you read the rule, purely for record keeping purposes. And if there were case studies done, uh, I think eyebrows would be raised as to the scope and types of projects which some districts are being uh, encouraged to process as administrative amendments. Big multi-million dollar projects as administrative amendments. So that's a concern with the administration of the program at present. Another concern, I guess the final concern about the NRB is when uh, projects are appealed, um, many of these cases now are resolved through settlement agreements. And I, I think a lot of those settlement agreements result when the only entities participating in the appeal are the applicant and the NRB. And there's nothing wrong with settlement agreements. The settlement agreements date back to when there was an environmental board. But this, the distinction is this. The environmental board said, we welcome settlement agreements, but we recognize a responsibility to do that independent fact finding to ensure that the 10 criteria are met. It's not enough to have two people come and say we've reached an agreement. Act 250 is not a lawsuit like plaintiff versus defendant. There is a public responsibility, a public interest at stake in terms of the, of the uh, 10 criteria. So anyway, my, my point is that um, some of us feel that there is um, overuse of these settlement agreements, uh, perhaps to the detriment of uh, the 10 criteria and the effects of the project itself. Problems with the environmental court. Now, I also want to note, just as I said, I have a lot of respect uh, for Senator Snelling. Uh, I had to get, uh, the pleasure of working with uh, now Judge Durkin when he was the chair of the District Chief Commission. And I also worked with Tom Wal Judge Walsh when he was hired by the Environmental Board. Uh, so I know these folks and they have great expertise and great intelligence. But having said that, uh, they're part of this judicial system. So, you know, one concern I have is I look at the statistics for the processing time. 
by the, uh, by the uh, environmental division of the Superior Court. <laughs> And I don't want to say the numbers are cooked, but I think if you go into those numbers deeper, uh, the average time to process uh, is all sort of bunched together. And if you look at it in terms of the contested cases and measure that with the time the environmental board might have taken the process the same type of case, I dare say the environmental board probably did things somewhat quicker. Uh, the environmental decision, the environmental, I'm sorry, the environmental court process is, uh, in my opinion, hyper legalistic. It doesn't have a focus on the fact-based uh, interpretation of the 10 criteria. Uh, by its nature, it has diminished public participation. If you can't pay to have counsel, you can't play. You can't go to court. Uh, yes, uh, the judicial system in Vermont has encouraged uh, pro se people to participate, but easier said than done. People are afraid to go into the court, quite frankly. Uh, so there has been a diminishment of public participation. <clears throat> Act 250 is not a tort action. Act 250 is not a contract dispute. Act 250, most of the time, is not viewed as a divorce proceeding. It's a humor there. Um, and it's a different mindset going into the judicial proceeding. So therefore, you know, I feel that um, a new board is the way to go, a new citizen board, similar to uh, the Vermont Environmental Review Board, which is in the, in the current bill. Um, I would favor a board more similar to the old environmental board rather than the Public Utility Commission. Uh, I have helped some folks out with stuff before the PSB, now the TUC, and it's a different, um, a horse of a different color. Uh, so environmental board, something like the environmental board would be my favor. Um, a board that would have its emphasis on land use decisions rather than process and procedure. Uh, a board that would consist of broad-based expertise, um, a cross-section of the Vermont community. It worked well for 32 years. It can work well again. Um, and I think that's very important, particularly if the legislature produces new jurisdictional triggers for Act 250, be it issues of forest fragmentation, uh, carbon impacts, uh, uh, new jurisdiction over high elevation settings, et cetera. Just as the environmental board had to figure out what do we do to breathe life into primary agricultural soils, aesthetics, undue water. The same thing's going to play out, you know, with new jurisdictional triggers in cases that are appealed to the new entity. And I think um, uh, the Vermont community at large is better served by having that citizen panel, again, with broad expertise to sort those issues out like was done the first time. So finally, um, again, I favor a body that would be uh, diligent with fact-based, ability to do rulemaking, and training of commissions and staff, and that would be the answer to ensure predictability and consistent outcomes uh, throughout the state. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Representative Odie. Uh, just one other thing. You said something at the very end, something versus process and procedure. What was it, fact? Uh, that it would be uh, fact-based. Um, fact and anchored in land use decisions rather than uh, becoming ensnarled, overly ensnarled in process and procedure. Fact based on land use, impacts on ecosystems. And I'd be glad to reduce my testimony to writing also. That would be really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. suspicion that the, the two gentlemen that, that testified before me might have some opinions with respect to the proposals out there. I am taking a different approach and really a, attempting to address or I'll attempt to address sort of the nuts and bolts of uh, the appeals and structure of the Natural Resources Board status quo, what it looked like um, as the Environmental Board and what the, what the committee's proposal looks like in the, in the draft bill. Um, 
I don't anticipate that I'm going to take a whole lot of time. So if there are questions along the way, I'm happy to address them. So I'm first going to go through the uh, Natural, board, uh, Natural Resources Board status quo, how we deal with appeals, um, Environmental Board uh, appeals, and then the proposed Vermont Environmental Review Board appeals. And I thought it might be helpful, um, I, you've all seen this, this chart, but I thought it might be helpful just to have a little bit of a review with respect to the layout and the structure of the board and staff. Um, <clears throat> the, the board, consists of statutorily uh, four members and a chair. The chair, of course, is, is Chair Snelling who's here with us today. And there are, she's the only paid staff, or the only paid permanent board member. There are four other volunteer um, board members. We meet roughly once every two months to discuss matters of policy and uh, general administration of the board. Um, then, of course, as you know, all of the sort of the middle uh, bubbles are how our, our staff is laid out. And um, ultimately, the board and the, uh, and the staff all exists to help administer and support the nine district commissions who are on the ground making decisions with respect to permitting on a daily basis in these nine different regions throughout the state. Currently, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, the NRB does not hear appeals from district commissions or district coordinators as to substantive matters. And as you likely know, we also don't hear appeals with respect to permitting decisions from the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, the, and and this, is, this, this, this argues to what Mr. Stanek was just discussing. We do participate um, in appeals to the environmental court, and those appeals consists primarily or, or entirely of district commission decisions concerning permits or permits, permit denials and district co coordinator decisions concerning jurisdictional opinions. Jurisdictional opinions are issued by coordinators by request of any person uh, to make a determination as to whether or not Act 250 jurisdiction exists over a given project. Uh, so those are appealable to the environmental court just as uh, permits and denials of permits are appealable to the environmental court. Uh, we currently have some limited, some limited appellate authority to hear permits um, from district commissions with respect to fees. As a matter of practice, I don't believe we've heard a single one of these appeals in the six years that I've been at the Natural Resources Board. We also have uh, authority to hear appeals um, from determinations of energy compliance that are issued by the, uh, by the Department of Public Service. We were granted this authority a couple of years ago through Act 174. Similar to the fees, we have not yet heard one of these appeals. As a general matter, the, um, these determinations, I think, are worked out pretty well in advance and are, are not necessary uh, to be appealed. Uh, we do have that authority. Um, and finally, with respect to our authority, we do hear, um, theoretically at least, we're authorized to hear requests for findings of fact and conclusions of law with respect to um, certain criteria and designated growth centers. So that's the status quo of appeals. That's how, how we function. That's what we are authorized to hear. It's a relatively small universe of appeals that we're authorized to hear and a very small universe of appeals that we participate in as any other party at the environmental court. So this is just a graphic to show you where appeals go. And as of now, as I indicated, both district commission uh, decisions regarding permits and district coordinator decisions regarding jurisdictional appeals both go to the environmental court. And as Mr. Stanek had indicated, the Natural Resources Board on a case-by-case -case basis will make a determination as to one, whether or not we intend, the Natural Resources Board intends to participate, uh, what position the board intends to take at the appeal, and uh, to what degree we intend to participate on any given appeal. So I did have occasion to go through. Um, we have a question from Representative oh, Dolan. Yeah. Um, given the size of your staff, um, yeah. and I imagine if you decide to go through a, a court proceeding and appeals process, that takes quite a bit of resources, I imagine. 
how how do you even um, can contemplate participating in appeals process with such limited staff? You know, that's a great question. So, um, and then just to give you a little bit of background, we currently have two attorneys, myself and our Associate General Counsel at the Union, who I think you've all met. Until about three years ago, we had three attorneys on staff. So um, our, 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 our legal staff was cut by a third overnight three years ago. Um, and, and it is difficult. Um, aside from a number of other tasks that the legal, that the legal department manages, at the Natural Resources Board, we have to put a significant amount of time into our appeals. And as you may or may not know, litigating a case at the, at the uh, Superior Court Environmental Division can take quite a bit of time and resources. So I think to a certain degree, our participation is at least in part limited by our resources. We do the best that we possibly can do with the resources that we have. Um, and this graphic here, shows approximately um, how many cases are on appeal at, in any given year under the current system at the environmental board. Um, so I'll give you a couple, you know, a little bit of time to sort of reflect on the numbers here. Um, I have a similar graphic that tracks the last six years of the environmental board. So you'll be able to see the average numbers, both in terms of quantity and the average duration that each um, that appeals took in order to in order to conclude at the environmental court. Uh, probably the most relevant column to look at is the last column, the peach or pink column, that takes both um, permit appeals and JOs and collates them into averages. So that's probably the most relevant if you, if you don't want to pay too close attention to all the other numbers. Probably so it's 14 and a half appeals on average over the last six years and the average duration of each of those appeals was 335 days at the environmental court. Um, these numbers, by the way, these numbers I got from uh, Jerry Tarrant's submissions. He, at some point, maybe during the Act 47 commission process, he submitted um, printouts from the Superior Court that uh, that indicated the length and duration of, of, of permanent JO appeals, and I've just put them into a graphic origin. So the structure of the former environmental board, I think you, you all have a, a, a general idea of what it looked like. Um, I think it's great that we had both Mr. Stanick and Mr. Groveman here who had uh, a lot of, uh, who were able to spend a lot of time and reflect on their experiences uh, with the environmental board. I started working for the state after the Natural Resources Board became the Natural Resources Board. And so I don't have a personal perspective on, on what it was like to work at the Environmental Board. So this is really just, this is all just gleaned from the last set of statutes and rules that were in effect at the Environmental Board prior to 2004, before permit reform. So the, the board consisted of uh, nine members um, appointed by the governor. Uh, to a four-year term. Uh, there were up to five alternates. The members were removable by cause. The chair served at the pleasure of the governor. Uh, the chair of the board, uh, and this is, this is an important piece of the former environmental board, and this feature is actually included in the current proposal for VERB. Uh, the chair of the board may appoint the hearing officer or a subcommittee to hear any appeal or petition before it. So there was that flexibility for cases that may not have needed the full robust review of a nine-member board there was the flexibility to appoint the hearing officer. I don't know how often that happened in practice. Um, and at the time in 2003, the, the fee to appeal a decision to the Environmental Board was $100. Uh, environmental Board heard all matters de novo, uh, which is the same standard at which the court currently hears appeals uh, from distributions. <laughs> And similar to the current court's uh, jurisdiction, the former environmental board heard appeals from district commission permitting decisions and also uh, decisions um, from district coordinators concerning jurisdictional opinions here. And here's a summary of the numbers from the last six years 
that the environmental board was in effect. And again, you know, I think if you want to pay most attention to the combined numbers in the pink or peach columns, um, you'll see that, in fact, Ed's uh, intuition was correct. The environmental board took about 50 days on average, less than the court, to review, um, to review appeals and to render a decision. It's also no noteworthy, however, that there were a number of, the, the number of appeals that the environmental board heard was significantly more um, than the number that the court currently hears on average. You know, I, I suppose that number can be attributed to a number of different factors. Um, I, I don't know that anyone has, has the answer for sure as to why there are more appeals, why there were more appeals filed or in the days of the environmental board. It may have something to do with access to the board as opposed to the court, but I'd rather not speculate. And then just briefly, I, I, I went through the, um, the current proposed bill that sets VERB up. Um, and this is the last, I looked at the last um, version that I had access to, which was 5.3. I don't think that, I think that's the most current version still. Um, and, and it seemed like a number of the, a number of the elements of the structure of the board were yet to be determined, including the length of the term, um, how alternates were to be used, and so forth. Um, it, it did. It did uh, the current version of the statute appears to have used a lot of the same language from the last version of the statute that set up the environmental board. So the chair would serve at the pleasure of the governor. The chair would also be able to appoint a hearing officer or subcommittee to hear portions of or entire entire uh, appeals, um, and the. Uh, the proposed verb will also hear um, matters de novo, um, but it is noteworthy that the appellant, in the proposed version, the appellant will um, have the burden on all issues raised, which is a distinction between status quo and also the manner in which uh, the environmental board heard appeals. Um, and the, here's sort of a list of the jurisdiction that um, the proposed verb would have uh, appeals from the district commission and district coordinator, so nothing's really changed. Uh, I just did, I did want to point out to the committee that though I think that was the intent of the bill, uh, section uh, 6089 of Title 10, I think does need to be uh, edited in order to reflect that change. So not a big deal, just something to keep, keep your mind on. Um, <laughs> One, I think one major distinction between the current status quo and the environmental board, VERB is set up to hear appeals from A&R and DEC permitting, which is um, something that uh, the, the uh, court, the, something that the environmental board, well, I, I guess I, I'm not entirely, I, I, I believe that the board heard some appeals with respect to um, decisions from the from A&R and the department, and from DEC. But it's a significant switch from um, certainly from what the NRB is currently set up to hear. Um, by way of background, it's my understanding that there are about 10 permits appealed from DEC permitting um, that VERB would be uh, would have jurisdiction over to consider should this bill proceed. VERB will not hear enforcement matters or appeals from rulemaking. VERB will not hear appeals from municipal boards. Um, appeals from municipal boards uh, will, go, will, will continue to go to the um, environmental court. And appeals from VERB will be heard on the record by the Supreme Court. Um, and VERB will also have the authority to approve, though it's not an appeal, regional plans. Uh, the proposed fee for an appeal to VERB is $250. So that's just a quick overview of the differences between the three versions of the Natural Resources Board. Um, I hope it provided you a bit of insight. I'm certainly happy to take any questions if you have any. Representative Dolan, what's the current cost typically when you're talking about? To appeal? Fee, for an appeal? A fee to be paid yeah. at so 250 What the fee? I, we, I've heard, let me just to preface it, I've heard that it's very expensive under the current model. The fee to appeal to the Superior Court is $295 currently. 
that then that changes on a maybe not yearly, but you know, every so often the fee will change. But that's the current thing. Representative uh, B. Very informative, by the way. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, I have a question here. So right now the appeals are never on record. Yeah. The way you have it written here is that it'll be on record. That's right. So right now they're not on record. So right now the appeals go from the district commissions to the superior court de novo, which means the superior court will hear all the evidence that was put forward at the district commission level again and render its own legal conclusions with respect to the evidence that it hears on appeal. Appeals, the proposed, um, the, upper, the proposed setup for VERB, the VERB, the Vermont Environmental Review Board, would hear appeals de novo, much in the same way that the Superior Court currently hears, and then on appeal to the Supreme Court, it would be on the record, much in the way it is today. So, so the levels of appeal uh, and the manner in which they're heard would not change. Okay, thanks. Sure. Representative Cullen. This is in the uh, light of levity. Could you help me? Is this when a verb becomes a noun? <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be. <laughs> I think we're there. <laughs> okay, Representative Dolan. Um, I'm interested to know a little bit more about your opinion on accepting ANRDC permitting appeals. And the reason, again, I'm worried about staff yeah. and staffing. Already, I imagine you're putting some constraints of which cases you would take on in an appeals process. I imagine, has, as you mentioned, there's some limitations sure. it's causing you. And yet, if adding on top of that an additional plus or minus 10 new cases from a different body, um, not tied to criteria, although there's you know there's some relationship there, obviously, um, is worrisome. And I'd love, I'd love your opinion on that Sure. So my let me just preface this. My my answer that you'll hear in a moment is not uh, an endorsement one way or the other of, of the decision that you will all ultimately make with respect to appeals. Uh, but I, I think I can say, as a matter of fact, if the to be created verb were to handle um, appeals from DEC, we would certainly need more staff um, to 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 handle that to handle those additional appeals. Um, likely attorneys and administrative staff as well. The, the numbers um, that we would need, I, I, I couldn't really, uh, you know, even even offer you a uh, an educated guess right now. It's something that if you're interested in hearing, you can put some more thought into. But I think I can say that we would certainly need more staff to handle that level of, of, of activity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know how many staff? You had before when appeals went there? Um, well, John would probably know. Do you happen to remember how many attorneys were on staff back? No, there were more. There were more attorneys. I don't remember the exact number. There were maybe two more attorneys. I, I think if this change was made, just to keep in mind that you know um, the staffing at the environmental court would have to be considered. If you're taking um, you know some of the work away there, you know there there's I think you'd be moving things around some, some, somehow. Um, but yeah, there was more staff. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely more staff. I, I, and we can get those numbers for you. Yeah, that'd yeah. be helpful. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Guys. Sure, no problem. Yeah. Great. All right, we have Jim Pimon up next. representing citizens groups and consumer groups but as long as I have not to make money because that's not how to make money I'm doing it because I care and I care about this bill and I care about this process that's why I'm here. I have prepared um, a handout which you can totally find on your machine here. I have paper copies in case anybody wants them. Can we 
may say I'm going to report from the trenches. The reality today is that applicants and experts control the process. Permits routinely rely upon computer modeling and other highly technical expert submissions, such as HydroCAD storm modeling, CAD and noise modeling, wetland delineation. And I can tell you that every good lawyer in Vermont who represents developers, and there's some great lawyers who represent developers, and you're going to hear from some of them tomorrow, they will not use an expert that doesn't support their conclusion. As lawyers, we're trained not to do that. We go to one expert, and the expert doesn't support the conclusion our client wants, we get another expert and get rid of the first one. a &R and the district commissions impose no requirements of full disclosure. So if, suppose you're doing stormwater modeling, and the modeling doesn't work out the way you want, for the first expert, you get rid of that expert. You don't have to disclose that the first expert said this is going to be a disaster. Similarly, if you go forward with, say, your stormwater modeling expert, what we found out is that neither a &R nor the district commissions had the capability to run those computer models. Those computer models are essential for stormwater modeling and noise modeling. What we found out is that um, a &R has to take the word of the applicant's experts. Believe it or not, that is what's happening in Vermont right now in 2019. So one case I had, I had clients, fortunately, had the resources to hire their own hydrologist with the same computer model. And we got these so-called native data data in a format from the applicant's engineer. And we ran it through our expert's computer. What happened was error message, error message, error message, error message. Error message after error message, because the computer model said you can't do this. Your assumptions don't work. So that only came out at the environment report stage where the disclosure of the underlying data was required. Unfortunately, I've had this discussion with Mr. Chapman many times. Um, the way the system works in Vermont, that the, the permits that give rise to a presumption of compliance, whether it's water quality or air quality, those are negotiated by the applicant's experts with the agency over time. It could be months, it could be, I've seen somewhere it's years, where the applicant's experts are meeting with ANR's experts on the air quality permit, for example. Until they reach a tentative agreement, there is no public process. There's not even notice to the public. Is only notice to the public when an agreement or a tentative agreement is reached. This is what your permit application is going to look like, and here's a draft permit. And at that point, the public gets a whopping 30 days notice. During those 30 days, you can do a public records act request, and if you're lucky, you'll get an answer within the 30 days. And you have to hire your own expert, and then you have to figure out what's wrong with what's been negotiated for six months or 18 months between the applicant's expert and What we've discovered is that even when ANR has a public comment period, there's no requirement that the native data be provided to the public. And there's no requirement that the applicant allow the public onto the site. So, for example, we had a wetlands case, and the applicant said that the citizens group, there was a pre permit site visit, but the citizens who were neighbors and who would raise money to hire their expert were not allowed on the wetlands. It was only, again, until the process reached the environmental court stage that it was an open process. And what I've been talking about is, is largely the water and air criteria that give rise to, where the ANR permit gives rise to a presumption of meeting the Act 50 standard. But there are other areas under Act 50 that don't hinge on presumptions, such as traffic, visual, and noise impacts. So there's no presumption here, but it's very, very difficult for a neighbor or a citizens group to respond to the applicant's expert unless the neighbor or the citizens group has its own expert, which can cost five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars. It's a lot of big sets. So what I've learned is that the way this works is the developer, what they spend on this process is plus the business expenses tax deductible. Or at least it goes into the basis for the capital gain. Which essentially it's written off. For neighbors and citizens groups, it's a major undertaking to try and make this a level playing field. As a result, the 
It's not true in all cases, but in many cases, the applicant's experts continue to determine the outcomes of many active 50 cases. That's not what was originally intended. So what are the advantages of moving back to the environmental board? First, the environmental board historically relied both on its expert staff and on experts retained to their cases. And it's right here, just one example where the, the board said, we're not happy with the evidence we're getting. And we have the right to hire our own expert if we want to. In that particular case, they didn't. But it was well recognized that if they're not happy with the quality of the evidence they're getting to protect the public, they can hire their own expert. And of course, the board had not only nine citizens who had a broad background, they weren't just lawyers. They had a broad background. They also had professional staff who knew how these the nuts and bolts of how air quality, and water quality, and wetlands, and so on work. So as you've heard from Mr. Stanek and Mr. Grove, the Queechee test was a great example of how the board the board's broad experience, nine citizens from all walks of life, its staff who were professionals, and its independent experts resulted in the preaching test, which has been relied on and quoted probably 5,000 times since then, not only by the courts and the environmental board, but the, by the PUC, which has adopted the preaching test. <clears throat> the environmental courts, law trained judges, uh, work hard, they try to do their best, but they are law trained judges. They're, they have the same training I have. They don't have the authority to hire expert staff. They don't have the authority to hire expert witnesses. So the law trained judges are stuck with the applicant's experts, unlike what the board did. And this has been mentioned already. I think the PUC already relies on its in house experts when it's deciding cases, and it has the authority to hire experts for particular cases, which it does. And I, I probably agree with Mr. Stanek that I, I, I think. A, Broader representation of the public is good, whether it's nine or seven or five. I'm a little leery of three. But if you look at how the PUC operates, you'll find that their professional staff does sometimes a fantastic job of asking really tough questions of, say, utilities experts. It, it's really, that part of the process really works well. Right now, that, just, that can't happen in, in after 50 years. Another advantage of moving back to the board model was better citizen participation. As the court cases have recognized, one of the purposes of the act was to facilitate participation by all potentially affected persons. The quote from the case was to enfranchise local interests and to encourage public participation. I think it's fair to say that despite best efforts by our environmental court judges, past and present, to welcome pro se litigants, the very nature of the process deters citizen involvement. It's, as Mr. Seneca was saying, it's the model of a tort case or a contract dispute. But we all know, everybody in this room knows it's really a public interest that's being decided. It's not a private interest. It's not a fight between one private interest and another private interest. So the model really is appropriate, and it discourages citizens from participation. And citizens really can't cross-examine experts that are critical, and that cross-examination is critical to the serving the public. I have a couple suggestions for fleshing out your bill. Obviously, it should, the board should consist of non-lawyers as well as lawyers. Whether it's five, seven, or nine, I think we need as broad a selection geographically as well as backgrounds as possible. And to facilitate citizen participation and a good process, um, I think your bill would be well advised to require a routine pre-trial sh pre sharing of reports, CAD files, the computer data and other information that are relied on by experts. So it's just a matter of course, you send your documents to whoever's on the other side. They reply to everybody. a and citizens groups, applicants. If you've got reports, you've got data, you share it. So it's a level playing field in that sense. And it costs almost nothing to applicants this, these days to just press send on the computer and email the data and reports. We're not copying anything anymore. These days. Second. There should be site visits upon request before the trial. The Environmental Board used to do lots of site visits, but it's also necessary to have so there's a level playing field and a productive process that others have access in order to prepare their testimony. Pre-filed testimony has worked very well in front of the Public Service Board. Um, in my experience, it's very, it has worked well when it has been used in the Environmental Court. So what this means is, instead of the Perry Mason routine, where somebody shows up in court, 
and they do a direct examination, which could take an hour. Sometimes direct examinations take a whole day. Then the other side has to furiously take notes, figure out what their cross-examination is going to be based on what they heard an hour before or the day before, and then cross-examine for an hour or a day. Instead of that, which is very unfriendly to citizens, and puts a premium on legal showmanship. When we have written pre-filed testimony, everybody knows in advance what the witnesses are going to say because it's written out in question and answer form. So a citizens group or a &R or the applicant will know what the other side is saying. It's not a game of surprise or ambush. Then there's cross-examination that is live but it's based on the same written pre-filed testimony everybody, everybody's had for 60 days or six months. So that hopefully leads to better results, but also fair results. There are some cases where that might, you might not want pre-filed testimony, so I would suggest that you require pre-filed testimony, but have, give the board authority to waive that. And similar with depositions. You all probably know what a deposition is. A lawyer asks an expert witness questions under oath with a court reporter there. If you have pre-filed testimony, and if you have sharing of documents or sharing of data beforehand, you won't need most depositions. It would be the exception, not the rule that you need them. But in some cases, you really do need them to straighten out confusion in the, the pre-filed testimony, or to find out really what the pre-filed testimony means. And I think a fair approach to that would be to, uh, if the parties can't agree on depositions, to let the board decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether there should be a particular deposition. And finally, um, to address the, the wall that's been discussed several times uh, this morning, the NRB used to have a rule that imposed what the rule called the Chinese wall. And the rule stated explicitly that no staff member and no board member who was assisting the board with the appeal could have had anything to do with the district commission process. That's, that's the Chinese wall is sort of a shorthand for what lawyers call separation, a kind of separation of functions. And if you look, say, across the lake to what happens in New York, right, with the Adirondack Park Agency, which is also which is small, they have separation of functions. So if someone is working with an applicant, if a staff member is working with an applicant, they will not have anything to do with the park agency board members when the board members are deciding a contested case. And that provides fairness to everybody. And if you follow the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act and contested cases, I think that the case law all requires, but it should be made explicit in any new statute. You would also make it easy for, say, the chairman of the NRB, when the governor picks up the phone and calls the chairman of the NRB and says, this is what I want to have happen, which does happen. The chairman can then say, if you speak to me, governor, I can't participate in the case. It's your choice. Because if I talk about the case with you, then I have to accuse myself. <laughs> and that, I think, is a necessary statement. So that's what I can say. Questions for Mr. Dumont? Remarkable. <laughs> it's late in the afternoon, everybody's falling asleep. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, Thank you for your testimony. My, my question is again about the ex parte, the debts under that quasi-judicial system that the Public Utility Commission uses, um, where the, the, the wall is between the board hearing officer and the public utility, uh, public service department, which is the citizen advocate. So there can be ex parte communication between the citizen advocate and the um, those involved in a particular case. But where the wall is is between the hearing officer and within within the, the appeals process. So so how would it play out here? I'm just trying to get a better understanding of where the wall is. Where's that ex parte? I, I got the the example with the, the governor's conversation, um, um, but I'm, I'm trying to get kind of more typical model and, so, um, and what would that look like? So in front of the PC, the department is a full party in the way it's structured now. It has been for 20 years. So the department is free to talk to anybody about anything. Right. 
Um, but the hearing officer is, is on the other side. And, and for full disclosure, I was a hearing officer there. So, uh, so I, I, I'm trying to get a better sense for how it would apply here. How do you create the right system so the public has confidence in that um, without hampering the, those those ex parte communications that are helpful for those that are you know in, in the negotiation right. or prior to coming to a board. So I'm just trying to get a better sense of sure. what you're trying to um, recommend. You know, the probate courts are a good example in Vermont. And I, I think the probate courts are part of the court system that is pretty universally welcomed and people deal with it think it's doing a great job because the probate registers are not bound by the ex parte contact rules. So you can walk into a probate court, say, the, in the Haiti courthouse in Middlebury, and the probate register will help you fill out the paperwork and say, this is what happens next. But they don't have anything to do with the, any decision making by the probate judge. So here you can have people who are designated not to have contact with the board, who will work with citizens. Here's how you fill out this form. Here's how the appeal works. You don't have a problem. And, and you could also, it's just like if there's staff that's advising a district commission on the case, you just know who those are in that case, and then they don't speak to the, they don't assist the board when that case is appealed. Okay, thank you. Oh. Representative Odie. Um, when you say to facilitate citizen participation, require routine pretrial sharing of the board's scattered data. Well, relied on by experts. Does that mean if you hire an expert, or gives you information that doesn't help your case, and so you don't want to have that. Person. And the next expert is the right expert for your case, for your argument. Would you be required to tell them everyone you've ever spoken to? I mean, what, 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 what does this mean? Yeah. That actually is really um, nuanced question requiring a nuanced answer. Under the existing rules of civil procedure in governing general civil litigation, one does not have to disclose experts that you've had contact with, but you've decided not to use. Um, there is an exception built into the existing civil rules that is hardly ever used. So in general, the rule is if you elect not to use an expert, you don't have to disclose anything you communicated about with that expert. And I would presume that would apply here as well. <coughs> but there is an exception built into civil rules. Should it be written in here so that it's not just a or what? Um, well, this is shorthand, so I would say sharing of reports files by a testifying expert to avoid to make that clear if someone you choose not to use for whatever reason there will be no duty to disclose your communications with or from that person okay, other information relied on by testifying experts. <laughs> reason, the federal rules of civil procedure, which have been adopted in Vermont, is the Vermont rules of civil procedure generally carve out from disclosure any communications with an expert that you decided not to use. Carved out. Uh -huh. So you don't have to disclose okay. anything about them. There are exceptions. For example, if you had an expert who was doing destructive testing of a, of a machine that failed, and that you had to speak to that expert to see what that part was like before the destructive testing happened you have a right to go back to that expert. But other than that, the idea is to encourage lawyers to, to communicate freely, and if they get bad news, it won't be held against them. OK, yeah. And the second question, um, deposition. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking deposition is like, uh, I'm in God forbid, Florida right now, but you need my information. But it sounded like you, you um, used it in a different way. Yes, depositions are used for both purposes. One is before trial to find out what that person is really thinking or what they really base their testimony okay. on. The other is what you've mentioned, which is if a witness can't be available for the trial, then you take their deposition to preserve it since they can't be. 
and, and that you would want to <coughs> make that available in all cases, the latter use. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, committee, we find ourselves in an unusual spot. A little bit of time before the 3 o'clock show starts. <coughs> Okay. Oh, that's real. Hey. Welcome. Barry, yeah, I'll right. go ahead and take a seat. Committee, we are going to get started. We're shifting gears to uh, H357, also known as the Wanton Waste Bill. First witness is uh, Barry Lund. How do you say your last name? Lundere. Lundere. Yeah. Uh, from the Humane Society. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Barry Laundrie. I'm the Vermont State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify uh, in support of uh, H357 on behalf of all of our supporters and, and uh, volunteers here in the state. Um, HSU has actively worked to eliminate um, inhumane and unfair sport hunting practices, um, including body gripping, traps and snares, bear baiting, wildlife killing contest, captive hunting, um, trophy hunting of rare and endangered species that are inappropriate for the species, uh, and, and, and ending lead, um, the uses of alternative ammunition that, that don't utilize uh, lead in order to protect wildlife <coughs> that might consume that um, carrion that has fragments left over. I go through all this to really emphasize, not that these other than one waste has much relevance to this bill, um, but to say that you know, as an organization, we do not take an, a position against um, fair chase subsistence hunting. Um, we focus on practices that we think should be reformed, uh, behaviors that even among many legitimate um, ethical hunters would find to be unethical hunting behavior, uh, and that's the focus of the one waste bill um, that we're debating here today. Um, I think we described in the last hearing what one waste is. Um, all I will say is that there is a case record, uh, you know, built by the department really that uh, shows that this is an issue. Um, you look back uh, a decade ago when the department put forward a proposal to the Fish and Wildlife Board. Uh, they had researched it. They thought that a water waste law was necessary and would be helpful in um, going after poaching and other um, illegal and unethical hunting behaviors. And they did a survey of their wardens and found, based on that survey, uh, an estimated 60 to 100 water waste incidents reported each year. And that's based on reporting from wardens, uh, not from members of the public or any other groups. So you know, clearly this was an issue that wardens were seeing um, and found it to be a problem and something that um, the department felt should be addressed at that time. So we're not you know, making up an issue out of nothing or we're certainly not trying to put in place a policy that is any different than dozens of other states have uh, in place right now. Uh, I would also point out that you know, um, in my testimony, you'll see a link to an article in the Mountain Journal um, published back in December that really spoke to the issue of decline in hunting, decline in participation, and some of the reasons for that. And, and this person, the, the author of that article, and other individuals that are quoted in that article are hunters, um, sportsmen themselves, and believe that um, Nonetheless, the things uh, regarding ethical hunting, humane uh, <clears throat> killing uh, of the animal, and no wanton waste are principles of ethical hunting. And by not living up to those standards, by not having laws in place that require someone to live up to those standards, it uh, encourages bad behavior, which and then encourages uh, and, and creates a public perception um, problem for hunters that are doing the right thing, that are ethical hunters, uh, that dissuades people from wanting to participate in that activity to spend, and encourages other uh, landowners and others to not uh, want that activity to be happening on their land. Um, and so I think there's a strong case, even if you're coming at this from a sportsman's perspective, of why you would want a one waste law on the book to at least create a baseline standard that says we're not going to kill an animal if the person has no intent to remove or use it for any, uh, any purpose. Um, 
that seems to me to be a pretty um, uh, uh, fair standard to have in place um, and a fair law to have in place. So I will just kind of respond a little bit to some of the questions and concerns that came out of the last hearing to hopefully to address some of them before I, I am happy to take your questions. So, I think a lot of this revolved around the issue of enforcement and, and can it be enforced and what, what, what um, you know, is this something that's worthy and, and, and capable of being enforced? And I think it's important to think of that and maybe in two components. And one is, you know, can this committee, can this legislature craft a, a law or a policy that's clear enough that wardens can go out and enforce it in a, you know, fairly neutral way and, 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 and apply it uh, appropriately where it needs to be uh, applied? And, and then two is, you know, it, is the actual evidence collection, can you gather the evidence as a ward necessary enough to really make charges stick? Um, and so I'll, I'll focus on maybe on the first aspect of enforcement um, and some of the questions that were raised about that. I know there was an issue in the bill about the term uh, reasonable uh, and what that meant and whether that was appropriate and did that leave so much up for interpretation that, you know, you'd never be able to, you know, determine what is a reasonable effort to retrieve uh, the animal. Um, you know, first, that is a standard that is routinely used to denote a, uh, a, a standard that, that the legislature would like to put in place in law, but also realizing that there is discretion among the enforcement authority for how and where that's uh, carried out. It's, uh, you know, it's a term that's commonly used, and it's not uh, a, an unheard of standard. I will, you know, if you look at the Vermont statute, I did a search um, for the word reasonable. It appears 2,044 times in the entire Vermont statute. If you limit that to just the wildlife statute and regulations, it's 167 times that the word reasonable appears. Now, did I look at every instance? I'm sure there's some that may be not, not applicable, but um, it's a word that's commonly used, let's put it that way. Um, and so I think is entirely appropriate for this bill. Um, two, uh, I think there was questions about what activities that we wanted to have covered under this law, uh, and in particular, um, nuisance activities or someone protecting their, their property or themselves from damage being done. That is not the intent of this bill, and we would be more than happy to work with the committee to create um, an exception for that. I mean, uh, that was never intended to be a focus of this uh, um, of this of this bill. Um, there already, I will point out, in the fur bear statute, nuisance statute, there already is a exemption contained in that uh, that section of the law um, that exempts individuals from all other laws and regulations of the state. So, if you were nuisance trapping um, a for a bear on your land, for example, you already would be exempt. But if, there's necess if it needs to be made entirely clear that that's not what we're focusing on, um, we're happy to work with the committee to do that. And I also think that um, can be done in conjunction with um, there are some animals, such as bear, that have particular requirements that you have to work with the department if they are causing a problem on your land. We, you could make that in sync where you, you give an exemption, but you make it contingent upon them complying with any other species-specific regulations that may be in place. Um, two, I think there was a question of what did the bill mean by use? Um, and in particular, I think there was a question around were we considering the use of fur to be a legitimate use? Yes. That is what the intent of the bill is. Um, we're happy to look at, for example, language in Alaska that specifically references um, the use of edible meat and fur of the animal. However, it would be helpful for this committee to make that clear, um, that we're not just talking about eating the meat of the animal for consumption, that there are other um, uh, uses of particularly the fur that would be legitimate and would be um, not consider one waste if that was if that was done, and we're again happy to make the bill clear if that's uh, if there are questions about that. Uh, and um, finally, I think there's a question about field dressing of it, of animals and whether that would be appropriate. I, I would have no problem with a provision saying if the animal is appropriately field dressed in accordance with Fish and Wildlife regulations that we wouldn't consider that 
long ways. I do think that it's important for that to be in response to an actual policy of uh, the department or the Fish and Wildlife Board and not just an open-ended exemption, but I think as long as the person was complying with um, what the department felt like was the appropriate way to field dress a particular species of animals, uh, we have no problem not considering you know that a want to waste issue. I think that's reasonable too. Uh, so that maybe it hopefully will address some of the what I thought were some misperceptions about what the intent behind the bill was, and hopefully will uh, you know, indicate that we're willing to work with you to to, to craft the right bill. Um, it, if I have just two more minutes, um, uh, you know, the second question is about enforcement by wardens themselves. Can this law be enforced? And I think it's fairly obvious that it can. Will it be able to be enforced in every circumstance where we might think one waste happened? Of course not. But that's the same uh, same situation is in place for almost all fish and wildlife regulation. We have track check times. Uh, we have bag limits, and some, a lot of these things can be difficult to know whether someone's complying with them. It doesn't mean we don't have the standard uh, in place. Other states have these policies. They can enforce it. I think we can figure out um, how to do so in our state as well. Um, and I think it also is important because it, it sends a message to discourage that small percentage of, of um, hunters and trappers who are going to engage in, in that type of wanton waste behavior. It signals to them by having a law in the books that this is not appropriate behavior, that you can uh, get in trouble for doing it. And I think that, that, that is a, a um, effective discouragement for people participating in it. And I'll also say, too, I mean, we often hear on other issues that the department relies quite a bit on hunters and trappers themselves to self-regulate, to self-enforce, to report when there's other problematic behaviors uh, going on by others that um, reflects badly on them or there are violations of the law. You know, I think on a, on a bill like this or a law like this, we would certainly be looking to that um, participation and, and uh, collaboration with uh, and, you know, hunting and trapping uh, trappers who, who may be able to see violations happening um, uh, in a clearer way than, than others might. Um, so, I'd also like to just respond to a couple arguments that were put forward um, outside of the enforcement area um, that that we already have one waste standards for certain species, so this isn't needed. And, and I appreciate the department singling out, you know, bear, moose, and certain species for additional requirements for what uh, a person might, have, you know, a hunter might have to do to 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 be in compliance with the law because of the unique um, aspect of the species. Nothing about this bill would change that. Again, like I said earlier, all we're trying to do is create a baseline standard uh, that you don't kill an animal if you don't intend to use that uh, animal for, for me to prefer. And uh, if there are additional policies for certain species, you can certainly layer those on top and nothing in this bill would change those regulations that are already on the books. Uh, I've already mentioned that it, it isn't an infrequent problem, according to the department's own warden survey. Uh, and then finally, I mean, I'd like, you know, uh, there was, um, I think, a very unfortunate analogy that was made by the commissioner at the last hearing to describe this activity as analogous to someone hitting an animal with their car and not going. Uh, not going to retrieve the animal, that somehow those were equivalent, and by prohibiting one and not prohibiting the other, you would somehow be condoning that behavior. I mean, I, I don't, it, it's difficult to respond because, you know, having known people who did strike an animal in their car, uh, the idea that you would make a comparison that someone who doesn't, after striking an animal, uh, hopefully they're still alive at that point, um, doesn't manage to make it out of their car and track the animal down, that that is the same as someone who deliberately shoots an animal and doesn't make any attempt to retrieve it. Um, I, I mean, I just want to say it's, it's, it's cons disturbing to me that um, that position would be put forward by our um, Fish and Wildlife Department. 
Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's analogous at all. Uh, and I don't think it has anything to do with the bill that we're discussing. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, about 357. Yes. How many can I ask? Is it my floor? Let's ask. So um, number one, I just want to state this, that you did not talk anything about Vermont. You skated around it the way I understood it. You have statistics from 2009. I, I need them for like 2018 um, and specifics. Like if you go by this, it's on, you know, 60 to 100 wanton waste events a year. That's in 2009. It's 2019. What are they? What are the actual statistics? You have to ask the department that. I'm asking you. I have no idea. Okay. The department has, I mean, one, I will say, you said I didn't. But you put it, you but did, you put you put it in I here. This is, your, this is your testimony. You said. Yeah, would you like me to provide the source for that? I, I do. I will provide the. And for two. I will provide the article where Kim Royer makes that exact statement. Just asking for facts. That's all I'm asking you for. And I'm, tell I, and I'm telling you, first of all, um, you said I didn't provide for months. To, uh, I want for my, that is it's for 2009 mom. we're in 2019 okay I, you can ask the I don't have that information all I can tell you is that's the information that was put forward by the department based on a survey they conducted with their wardens when they were pushing for a long waistband where are the facts now today you would have to ask the department I, they may have to conduct but you're coming in here giving me these facts and it's old facts okay that's, I made your point it is the only facts available okay, on this. Okay. On this. Just no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good for right now. Okay. Why? Well, but I'm good. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Okay. Thank you. Oh, I see you. I'm a lead bullet. The lead ammunition. Mm -hmm. What are all the kinds of ammunition that are? I'm not the person to ask. All right. But there, are, uh, in, in terms of other materials, uh, copper is the main one that's being that that is the most that I'm aware of. That's the most um, typical replacement for, for lead. Yes, she's asking a question that has nothing to do with this. Bill. It has nothing to do with the bill that we're talking. I don't. I couldn't even hear the question. I'm sorry. I asked about lead ammunition because I read it in here, but it, it yeah. doesn't have to do with the bill. Well, it's in his testimony, so. I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, I mean, it does have to do with this bill because uh, um, animals that are left discarded on the land and not removed contain lead fragments that can be consumed by raptors and other species that cause health problems and ultimately death. So to the extent that this law would require people to remove those animals, you're helping alleviate the lead ammunition poisoning issue with other wildlife species. That, but I just didn't know what other kinds of ammunition, ammunition there were and how much lead ammunition there is. But I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. There is, I mean, historically, it's all lead ammunition except for waterfowl, in which a lead ban went in place, I think, in the early 90s, I believe. Um, but other than that, the vast majority of ammunition is lead, uh, contains lead core. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Brenna Galt-Benzie. This is Congress's testimony. Is your testimony up on the web page? It, um, I just emailed it there not long ago. Um, I'm not as savvy as Barry, um, so I'm going to have to read my testimony 
off of the paper. For the record, let us know. Uh, for the record, you. I am Brenna Galdenzi. I am president and founder of Protect Our Wildlife uh, in Vermont. We are an all volunteer grassroots nonprofit. Uh, we represent over 2,500 members and supporters throughout Vermont. Um, thank you for the invitation today to provide testimony in support of H357 ban on wanton waste. Um, as a preliminary matter, I do think it's important to go on record again um, because it seems as though there is misinformation that's shared about my organization um, that we are an anti-hunting uh, group. Um, I've gone on uh, record in various uh, committee hearings refuting that, and I think it is important because uh, I don't want that messaging to detract from the important work that we perform. Uh, our organization is happy to have uh, hunters and anglers who are supporters. Some of them have emailed you in support of this bill, um, and if you actually wanted to testify as well. Um, so we had hoped that the department would have supported um, this legislation, uh, especially in light of their prior support uh, back in 2009 of a, of a similar uh, effort. It was going to go through the rulemaking process, not through the legislature. Um, and we really wanted to take this unique opportunity to collaborate with various stakeholders, um, you know, hunters and, and trappers, to figure out, you know, how do we remedy an area of, of shared concern. Um, I would like to respond to some of the issues that were raised at the last hearing. Um, again, I want to I want to emphasize that this bill is not anti-hunting or anti-trapping. I think that it might be argued that this bill is pro-hunting and pro-trapping because it's going to address some of the really unsavory behaviors that take place that tarnish ethical, responsible, sustenance hunters and, and hunters that, that respect their quarry. Um, it seeks to apply consequences to those who engage in wasteful killing, um, just as many other states do. Um, another point to make is that it was never the bill's intent to have a landowner uh, have to use the carcass of a rabbit animal, as suggested in the commissioner's testimony. Um, and I'm sorry this wasn't clear in earlier versions, but if the activity is not already exempted under Title 10, 4828, uh, we recommend that an exemption be made for people who are killing wildlife and defensive property. So an example of that would be killing raccoons who are getting into your chicken coop or fisher or what have you. You certainly wouldn't have to use or consume the pelt or the meat of that animal. Um, Another point is uh, the commissioner argued that the wanton waste ban would be too hard to enforce, um, but as Barry mentioned, the department's law enforcement division already enforces a wanton waste law on waterfowl, um, and the same should be able to be done for wildlife as well. Um, it's my opinion that just because a law is difficult to enforce, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an important law. I mean, think about Vermont's 75-year ban on snares uh, type of trap. It's been banned for a very long time. It's a very difficult, I would assume, uh, law to enforce, mm -hmm. but it's still still a good law, in my opinion. Um, and as I know that you know as, as lawmakers that you know, laws just aren't about consequences for wrongdoers. Laws are also about deterrence, uh, deterring bad behavior. Um, so again, while on the topic of clarification uh, that is needed to the bill that I, I recognize, um, page one, line 16 of the bill, uh, needs to be better defined to offer more clarity. Uh, we recommend Alaska's law that requires, in part, to salvage for human use the edible meat or fur of the animal or fowl. And I know Representative Bates had a question about, um, you know, consuming meat. Certainly, if you if you uh, shoot a deer and you don't eat the meat, you just maybe use the hide. You could certainly give that venison to a neighbor or someone else. You don't have to consume the meat yourself. Um, that was the original intent of the bill that HSUS provided. Um, without such definition of the term use, the law can be easily circumvented. For example, someone could take one feather of a crow they killed and said that they're using the animal. Um, I would like to highlight prior efforts uh, to enact the wanton waste ban by department members. Uh, Kim Royer is a senior staff member, well-respected biologist at the department. Uh, as well as a retired warden, uh, were two of the lead folks back in 2009 who supported a wanton waste ban. Uh, Royer was mentioned in a 2009 article in the Times Argus as follows, I quote, Kim Royer, a biologist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, told about 30 people in attendance that the wanton waste rule was needed, particularly as a public perception matter. 
Under the proposal, anyone who kills or wounds an animal while hunting, fishing, or trapping must make an effort to retrieve that animal so that it may be utilized. <clears throat> End quote. Uh, also, in reference to the prior wanton waste ban efforts, uh, former Commissioner Wayne LaRoche, some of you may remember, uh, he stated in the 2006 Burlington Free Press article, I quote, the wardens have no tools to address those people that are bad actors and will always be bad actors, end quote. More recently, a retired warden showed his support for a wanton waste ban and submitted an email to the Fish and Wildlife Board that is in the attachments um, that you have. Uh, this was just last April. The retired warden, who is also, I understand, a trapper and a hunter, uh, he states, I quote, I believe it is way beyond the time that the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department needs to implement a wanton waste law. I am aware that critics say they are just coyotes. During my career as a state game warden, I have seen bears, deer, and wild turkeys that were harvested, hung, and left to rot. I have also witnessed numerous spring shot muskrats, pelts intact, discarded by the side of the road, end quote. There are likely other wardens who would support a ban on wanton waste, but they are advised by the department to not share their personal opinions on department policy. So we have to wait for people like retired wardens to have the ability to come out and, and, and speak their truth about various wildlife policies. Um, there's an example of the stifling of dissenting opinions uh, documented in your handouts. Um, wardens who recently, well, a year ago, opposed the open season on coyotes uh, were told prescriptively by the colonel uh, to keep that opinion to themselves. Um, this email is in, a, is in the attached from May 2017. The email was sent by the colonel to his lieutenants. I quote, with regards to a coyote season, please keep that opinion to verbal only and among your peers. The commissioner is fighting daily to keep the status quo and needs all the help he can get, end quote. So the only reason why I mention that is I suspect that there would be more wardens and department staff who would support our efforts but I have to wonder if um, their opinions on, on this is stifled. Um, another area of concern for us and our state's wildlife rehabilitators who are members of our organization is that intact lead riddled carcasses are poisoning bald eagles and other scavengers like bobcats. Um, other states have wanton waste laws and so can Vermont. Um, Alaska is one of our country's most pro-hunting states. Um, they strongly support their wanton waste law. Uh, last week I spoke with a biologist with a 40 year history working in Alaska Fish and Wildlife. Um, he was a, a, um, named to the Fish and Game Board two different times, three different times by two different governors. Um, he has decades of experience working with Alaska Fish and Game and he told me that hunters there value their wanton waste law. Uh, he told me that Alaskan hunters, um, or I should say that the wardens have guidelines uh, that assist them in enforcement. And I can discuss some of these guidelines with you if you would like. Um, a host of other rural states, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, um, have lawn waste laws. Um, if the department has concerns regarding enforcement, as Commissioner Porter mentioned, there are a whole pool of resources for him to pull from. If I was able to talk to somebody from Alaska for 20 minutes and get such wonderful information, he could certainly do the same. Um, which animals do we value and which do we not value? Um, I think this is really important. Um, during the commissioner's testimony, he advised the committee that his department would be looking into possibly uh, enacting uh, perhaps field dressing regulations on uh, Vermont's, I quote, valued species. And he gave deer as an example. Um, the department should not be able to make policy decisions and management decisions based on which species they feel has value. Um, cow members believe that all wildlife has value, whether it's an animal, a crow, or a coyote, or a moose. They all have intrinsic value. They all should be respected. Um, they all have a fierce will to survive. Uh, crows are one of the most intelligent species. Um, they're known to have the uh, mental abilities of a seven-year-old child, um, yet they're killed in crow shooting contests in Vermont. They're used as target practice. Both are examples of wanton waste that happen every year. Um, and I'm almost done. Um, I would like to draw attention to Vermont Statute 10 PSA 4081 um, that requires the following, I quote, the protection, management, and conservation of fish, wildlife, and fur-bearing animals in this state are in the interest of the public welfare. The state 
through the Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife shall safeguard the fish, wildlife, and fur-bearing animals for the people of the state, and the state shall fulfill this duty with the constant and continual vigilance. So I don't know how the department is upholding the statutory requirement um, if they're essentially condoning killing foxes and otters and deer and coyotes um, purely for fun. I don't know where the protection, where the conservation, um, even the management aspects are in that statutory mandate. Um, you may hear that um, there's just a few bad apples that are conducting uh, these behaviors. Um, but the research that my colleagues and I, some of them are in the room, perform quite frequently, prove differently. I promise you, if anyone wants to sit down with me, I have videos, I have photos, um, more than you could possibly want of wanton waste that's happening in Vermont. Um, and I just want to quickly show, this is an example, you can pass it around, a Vermont hunter posted it to our page, kill them for fun and to save deers in Turkey, deer in Turkey. These are two uh, spring or summer shot coyotes. Their pelts are worthless. Um, when they're killed in the summer. I mean, that's a hunter saying he killed them for fun. Uh, we have uh, numerous crows who were killed last year, Vermont hunter. Um, nobody eats crows, as far as I know. Um, coyotes who were killed and piled and dumped in the woods. Um, someone just complained to the commissioner last year about coming across a pile, a box of uh, dead coyotes at Eagle Mountain. Robbie Pablo is out hiking with his wife. Um, and perhaps the most disturbing photo um, is one, and I don't know where it went, of a, right here. Um, this is a raccoon who was shot in the face by a hunter, and he says, expletive, yeah, ha, ha, ha. Um, don't know why this raccoon was shot in the face. Um, it's still alive, an arrow protruding through its nose with blood. His friends are rooting him on. Um, we forwarded that to the law enforcement uh, head and he said nothing can be done about that. Now, if there was a wanton waste law, um, perhaps that would have been wanton waste, unless the, cut, the raccoon was uh, getting into a chicken coop and it was killed in defense of property. But at least law enforcement would have been able to do something about that. Um, and in closing, um, in, 2000, in 2017, UVM, uh, UVM conducted a survey uh, by the Center for Rural Studies they asked if Vermont wildlife policies should prohibit the wanton waste of wildlife, except when the animals are causing damage to property or agricultural mm -hmm. products. The result of the survey indicates that 70.5% of Vermonters who responded supported policies that prohibit the intentional and wasteful destruction of Vermont's wildlife. Now those survey results don't surprise me at all. What does surprise me is the, is the department not supporting this common sense bipartisan legislation that we're, that we're hoping uh, the committee is interested in passing moving forward. So if anybody has any questions, I'll do my best uh, to answer them. I, just have, I have a very easy question. Yes. I promise it's not explosive. Yes. Yeah. Just clarify the value issue. Does a chipmunk have the same value as a moose? In the context of someone shooting chipmunks with a BB gun or a gun for fun. Yes, I don't think anyone should be able to kill an animal for fun. Okay. I think if an animal is killed, it should be killed for either sustenance or for use. Okay, no further questions. Thank you. Wow. Representative Odie. Um, when an animal is shot by a hunter and the hunter uses it for meat or takes the skin off of it to sell the pelt. What happens to the bullet in those cases? Bullet? I don't know anything about ballistics, um, but I, I know that the bullets do fragment um, in that if a carcass is left in the woods, that any animal scavenging on that carcass that has been lead shot in it is exposed to lead poisoning. That's whether it's a deer or a coyote. Coyotes are a big concern because they're killed in, in great numbers and they are they are routinely left in the field. Uh, Representative McCullough, then Bates. Um, my apologies, my, my mind must have been wandering through the woods. Um, you gave a survey right near the end of your mm -hmm. testimony. Yeah. Um, did you or, or will you please um, qualify that survey yes. a little bit for us and, and tell us when that was done? 
Um, there is a link um, on the testimony that brings you right to our website that tells you what uh, Center for Rural Studies methodology is. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Wildlife did pay for that survey question, um, along with the question relating to trapping in 2017. Um, and, um, and we chose Center for Rural Studies because they are one of the most highly respected um, you know, survey outfits. But if, if you'd like to see um, the actual survey itself, um, and the methodology, and, and our press release, and all of that, yep. that's on our website. Yeah, sure. Do you know the date offhand? Uh, 2017, the survey was conducted. 2017. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is the link you're talking about at the bottom of the last page of your first page, or is it one of the live links? No. The link should be, it's the uh, one that starts, it's uh, oh. footnote three. Oh. Yeah, okay. Docs, uh, doc, Wix, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Just one more question about that chipmunk thing. Yeah. You can't get off the chip. So, you know, the, the grade school kid comes home and they're playing with his BB gun and stuff, and his friends say, hey, I got a better idea. Let's set a rat trap and catch the chipmunk and stuff. Where do you guys classify that? Is that hunting, trapping? Is that, <laughs> you know, is that just wanton waste? Right. If someone is killing rats and mice, I mean, I have mice that chewed up my uh, wires in my car. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't kill them. I use other methods, but I would assume that they're killing them for a reason. Um, I don't think, again, the intent of the bill, um, I, I don't want to lose sight of all of the good things of the bill and get entrenched in in, in, in mice, but I, I do get what no, you're but, saying. No, but I'm talking about, you know, we have to encompass the whole thing in the bill. It says wild animals. Right. You know, and that encompasses, I believe, pretty much everything. Right. So, you know, you, you either have to eliminate wild animals and specifically specify what you want to go after. Right. So I, I'm just going back to my question. Where do you classify that as for, you know, the, the chipmunk issue? How, how do you classify that? I classify it the way that the bill is currently written is that it is wildlife, in that if someone is killing a chipmunk, um, they should be killing it, planning to, I mean, I don't well, know. you're dealing with 12 year olds. The chipmunk, <laughs> so you can eat a chipmunk. Okay. Or if you're killing it because it's uh, causing a problem, that would be exempted from a bill that I'd like to see. I don't, to go on record, and I think I get me where you're going, um, I don't think that any animal should be killed for fun. I know Representative Terrence Sandy made an example of kids shooting crows and ravens, which are actually protected, so I hope he's not endorsing that, um, as, as an example of, you know, why can't kids do this anymore? I mean, I don't think that's a good example. I don't think, and I know one of our members is a child psychologist, and she wrote testimony to in support of this bill. I don't think it's ever a good idea to allow a child just to kill something for the sake of killing. I mean. You need to respect all wildlife because if you're treating even the smallest of animals that way, I can't see how that would translate into treating a deer or other animals that way. Wouldn't you support education then? Wouldn't you support the education yeah. of in schools or, you know? H190? H90. H90. Well, wouldn't you support that? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Representative Forgans. Um, Back on. On, uh, okay, let me we'll go ahead. back on uh, line 15, line 14, line 15 of the bill. Uh, is it your feeling that it should be worded to say, <clears throat> as used in this section, waste means to intentionally, knowingly, recklessly, or with criminal negligence salvage for human use the edible meat or fur of the animal or fowl? That's that, Alaska's wording, that, yes. That, I, that's that would that's be, what you would say that paragraph should say. I, I think that would be better than how it's written now. It would offer a bit more clarity. Representative Dolan. Back to the party. Uh, I guess my, just to build on the, the, the chipmunk model, but it allowed me to um, mention that um, maybe not chipmunks are a problem, <laughs> but groundhogs are, or skunks in the compost. <laughs> Um, and I know that that in, in and of itself, those are um, have been known to be nuisance species in homes or homesteads where you're trying to you know, manage 
your garden, sure. and that's maybe for subsistence, um, or just managing your garden, period. Um, and um, we are prohibited from transporting wildlife, such as a groundhog, from the property to anywhere else. Yes. Um, and so, uh, and when I, I've searched through the other state models, and and I, I think all of us understand the the interest to ensure that um, that people are you know, educated and lawful, and um, and while at the same time um, uh, hunting and, um, and and supporting their um, recreational. Um, interests there. So how do we handle it? I, I think this language doesn't allow for us to kind of handle some of that management right. of nuisance species such as, you know, those chronic, I think there's yeah, a whole right. underground city of groundhogs in Vermont. So so I, I know that that's a struggle where people are trying mm -hmm. to be lawful um, and yet that's a forbearing um, species that yep. can be pretty disruptive to a homeowner. So. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, um, I did mention, I know I covered a lot, um, that it would be my recommendation, I mentioned in my verbal testimony, that there should be an exemption, a very clear exemption, to allow landowners to address wild animals causing damage. I know Commissioner Porter <clears throat> mentioned that people would have to use raccoons or foxes, you know, that have rabies or something. I mean, that was never the intent of the bill, and I, I worked with Barry on the bill. My intent of the bill from the get-go was that there would always be an exemption for landowners or muni municipalities or farmers to kill a groundhog or a fisher or whatever it is that might be causing damage to, to the property. Um, and as far as, um, you know, solutions to wildlife conflicts, um, you know, on our website we do offer a lot of great solutions for people to handle things, you know, non-lethally and sustainably, but that's not for everybody. And if somebody prepares to shoot or, or trap an animal causing damage, that the wanton waste ban would not apply to them. Okay, we need to keep yep. moving. Thank you. Thank you.
several different outfits that studied this. The Cent Wildlife Center in Virginia, um, they studied raptors, including eagle vultures, hawks, and owls that had ingested lead. And what they found was that the higher the lead level, of course, obviously, the less chance of recovery. But even at the levels that they saw, most of these animals died or were euthanized. Um, College of Veterinary Medicine in Minnesota, they treat about 120 to 130 eagles, bald eagles every year exposed to lead. Most of them die or euthanized. Once that brain damage occurs and that muscle damage occurs, you can't reverse it. That's what makes this so so tragic when these, these, these wasted animals are lying there with, with the uh, lead in their bodies. National Park Service in California, they were very instrumental in getting the condor back from the endangered species list. And most of the condors that they worked with had to have chelation therapy to try to save them from lead poisoning. Okay, so spent lead ammunition that's on the ground, maybe from shooting ranges, whatever you have, or areas that are, are uh, heavily hunted, much of this lead that's left from these carcasses um, gets into the water supply, goes into streams, goes into the rivers, and eventually goes into the lakes. So there's contamination there. Um, let's see, we covered that. Oh, the only, the last thing I wanted to say is um, there are five doctors in my family. My ex-husband is a psychiatrist as well as a neurologist. And from the experience of my experience of being a prosecutor and dealing with violent criminals, and my husband, my ex-husband's experience with uh, treating children with uh, violent problems, much, many of these children have been exposed to animal abuse at some point in their lives. So much so that the FBI has now considered animals sentient just because of their relationship with violence in the family and to the animals. There are multiple um, sources on the internet that will tell you the damage that's done to children that are allowed to commit violence against animals. Um, we really need to, to look into these things. And wildlife belongs to all of these vermonters. Wildlife is not the exclusive property of those who just want to kill them for fun. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Thank you. Thank You're very you. welcome. Good to see you all. I'll get that on your own. <laughs> A discussion about wanton waste before this committee, uh, February 26th, between the Fish and Wildlife Department commissioners and a committee member wandered far from the issue at hand. The discussion focused on the generally true but irrelevant fact that due to scavengers, nothing goes to waste in nature. It is true that at Dera Kaya will be consumed and used by scavengers large and small. However, that is not the meaning of waste within the context of the North American model, which explicitly means human non-use of a resource, killing for frivolous purpose. This is, an abund this is abundantly clear in the definition above. The word wanton cements the issue as it exclusively applies to and describes only human motivations and actions. If I kill a fox with no need of it myself, tossing it in the bushes to rot afterwards does not constitute a legitimate purpose. Pretending otherwise is strange to rationalize killing for killing's sake. That is a behavior civil society has a strong interest in discouraging for reasons well beyond wildlife conservation. Also at this committee's February 26th meeting, a hypothetical Vermont youth was enlisted to suggest that there's a nostalgic wholesomeness to whiling away a Saturday killing crows. Growing up in Vermont can be like a Norman Rockwell painting. I had the unfettered run of our surrounding woods, fields, ponds, and streams. Started fishing at three, learning to shoot at five. My father was an Air Force expert marksman, NRA farm, firearms instructor, and a Vermont hunter safety instructor. And deer, and deer hunting at 10, I learned from my grandfather, third generation Proctor Vermont native, and his two friends, Pete and John Hari. We had guns, bows, slingshots, soda can cannons, spent cartridge case cannons, and a real cannon. It was a little one. My, <laughs> my brother and I would burn through boxes of 22 long rifle ammunition until our targets were shredded, and then turned to shooting daisy stems at 50 feet. We did our share of dumb things, but we never would never kill for fun. We would no more shoot crows for entertainment than pull the wings off flies or crush barn kittens with hay bales. 
even before Dad started to teach us to shoot, he taught us a deep respect for life, to never kill without justification, and then to always kill quickly. Along with reading his books like Wild Animals I Have Known by Ernest Thompson Seton, that lesson was crystallized for me when he found us happily torturing a bloodsucker when I was four. I imagine that most Vermont kids learning, learned hunting ethics in broadly the same way, then and now. The, issue, the lessons take to varying degrees. Unfortunately, some people don't get it yet. And now they can reach wide audiences. Few people I knew as a kid would casually abandon a wounded or dead animal in the woods, let alone kill just for the thrill or out of malice. And hopefully no one I knew would kill as many animals as possible or torment those not already dead. Yet it happens. It probably always has. But now it can be filmed in detail and publicized on social media. And however relatively few such hunters may be, their ecological impact can be locally disruptive. And moreover, their visibility, heightened dramatically in our social media age, sullies the image of all hunting in the eyes of non-hunters. Demographics have changed. They were changing in the 1960s when parents of friends of mine, new friends of mine, who just moved to the area for jobs at IBM, would not be allowed, the kids weren't allowed in the woods. Today, many Vermonters may not may know so few hunters that they can easily believe that these crude and cruel videos and photos represent the norm, especially when they are tolerated by the Fish and Wildlife Department, and even more so when they can see the department oppose efforts to stop them. Ironically, according to Kim Royer, around 2006 or 7, our Fish and Wildlife Department, possibly inspired by the public outcry for killing contests around that time, did try to stop them, suggesting regulations banning wanton waste to the Fish and Wildlife Board. The effort failed. Fast forward to 2018, and the legislature had to ban killing contests over our Fish and Wildlife Department's opposition. Now the commissioner, at least, appears to be doing a full 180 to oppose banning wanton waste, too. Taken together, there seems to be a pattern. At a January 2017 meeting of this committee on H60, which led to the 2018 Vermont Coyote Population Report, the commissioner noted that the department had asked hunters not to post disrespectful videos of piles of dead coyotes and stated that such social media posts were regretful but notably did not express any criticism of the behavior itself. Digging the hole deeper, the department leadership now blames the undermining of hunting and the department on animal rights groups that uncover abusive whacking and stacking photos and videos rather than the people who do the whacking, stacking, and filming. I know that personally from talking to them personally. It is like blaming a building inspector for undermining your house value by exposing rot in the rafters to your bank. Altogether, these may play well to a select few, but I suspect that they fuel a feedback loop that continues to erode the image of hunting, hunters, and the department in the eyes of the general public. That is a bad long game strategy. There are pressing reasons to rebrand hunting to adapt to the change in demographics and landscape of the 21st century. To preserve hunting, we should not only highlight its critical importance to our common environment and the benefits to society, local communities, and individual hunters and their families also simultaneously stand unequivocally against its abuses so that hunting can at least start to retain and eventually regain the understanding and support of all Vermonters, whether they hunt or not. Supporting H-357 along with any direct reduction in wanton waste would be an important step in that process. Thank you. None. <laughs> All right, thank you for coming in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have one more witness who's going to be on the phone at 4 o'clock. Do you want to see if you can get it? Sure. The state of Pennsylvania, um, in their language, um, doesn't use the term use, but uses the term retrieve, retain, and lawfully dispose of. Um, have you considered uh, moving away from the term use? Um, you know, many of the states have targeted uh, their wanton laws specifically to game species because they don't want to see, obviously, the mistreatment of game species when you're where you're operating under a license for your your bag limit um, specific to the you know, species you're you're hunting. Um, but in this case, and, and we know Pennsylvania is one of the country's leading states for um, deer herd management, 
uh, interested to know your res your response to to that. Um, that Would you repeat? Yeah, I'm not familiar with the Pennsylvania. They, they don't so use the term use. The language that they use. They don't use the term use, but they talk about it about making a reasonable effort to retrieve, retain, or lawfully dispose of such game or wildlife. Mm hmm And I think that um, that is the difference. I don't know that it's in um, some of the other states, but um, I haven't looked at all of them. Um, it's not my bill, so I haven't. Yeah, no, no. Just curious to know your whether that language your, would be, um, be, uh, you know, um, adequate or not. I think I have some concerns about it because um, one of the one of the purposes that I see in terms of wanton um, or purposes behind wanton waste, in, in my view, is to prevent the you know needless killing, like killing for the sake of killing. And so I think that the language in Pennsylvania, you still leave open um, the ability for people to use um, animals as target practice and to um, perhaps um, also for trophy taking. And I don't think that either of those practices are, are things that the Vermont um, public in general would support. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. <coughs> Bye. <laughs> Good committee, any discussion on what we've heard? Representative Vargas. This is not a question, I'm just wondering, other than members of our committee, are there anybody sitting out there that are opposed to this bill. All I've heard are people that are in favor of the bill. Well, I would say I would be remiss not to tell you that um, this this is a remarkable stack of, this is for, these are messages for all of us, and every one of them is supporting the bill, and they're all individuals only from all over the state. If you want to look through them, they're available. Um, they're all simple, and there are more. And there are more coming, obviously, to all of us via email. Is that who just waved their hand? Right. McCullough, Dolan, I can't remember. Well, I can't, I don't know who was waving. I, I had one question. Oh, okay. Well, you, you didn't see my hand wave, but you you, you, you read my mind. Um, I'm, we've already heard sort of in response uh, to Representative Forgites that the administration doesn't support this bill. Other than that, I will stipulate that I have gotten, uh, and I presume most of the committee has, a plethora of emails supporting this legislation. And um, in addition to that, I will estimate, and I think this is this is an interesting um, an interesting uh, statement gotten more email about this in support of and none against um, of this bill than I got combined pro and con on um, H57 the abortion bill and I think that really really and take that with a grain of salt <laughs> take that for 50% um, I think that that um, speaks volumes to what Vermonters want, and yes, they have not all been, all the bills of, or letters of support have not all come from um, non-consumptive users. They've come from hunters. I am a hunter. I am from a hunting tradition family. And I'm a trapper. Um, so it, you can, I know the committees received both of these same things. Maybe I've received more because I've got several other fish and wildlife bills um, on, on the book, or on the board here, but um, I haven't found one yet who is against this, um, uh, this bill, other than uh, the commissioner and AKA the administration. So to sort of answer that query, that astounding in my 
in my uh, 16 and a half years as a legislator to have it that strong. Certainly, POW has, been, has done a good job on this. Um, I, I've been studying the um, the materials that um, Michael LeGrade put together. He put together the launch and waste laws in other states. Mm -hmm. And the impression I have with looking through this is that um, Every, the states listed here are states with hunting as being a really important traditional use of our landscape, which is a good thing. Um, it gave me the impression that each one is trying to also solve some issues. I mean, if you're trying to manage a deer herd, you want to manage that deer herd in the most sustainable way possible. So it's there for tomorrow's hunt and next year's hunt. And um, and it looks like in some some states they've been dealing with abandonment of carcasses, even abandonment of carcasses at uh, butcher facilities, so, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, but I um, so I, I found that that there was a real. Um, just from reading these, a real effort for these states to ensure two things. One is that sustainable management of species. The other is, and I think it gets to it, a lot of these states are out west where you have more um, um, species, whether it be bald eagles or others, that are, you know, <coughs> on those are scavengers, scavenger species. And so it's in the interest of states to ensure that there's no impact on the viability of scavenger-related species. I think it's a little bit. Um, and our, this year, we heard our bald eagle population is recovering from, from being non-existent in one so I, I would, um, I, I think we, we did receive a number of comments, obviously. It would be helpful for me to hear more from the, the hunting community to, to get a sense for what we're trying to achieve here. And I, I think this, this was a start, but I think we already identified some loopholes and um, and have you know, the hunting community come and help us address this inherent problem, whether it was 2009 or, or this year. Um, there's obviously a, a need there. Um, I, I think working together with, with um, users um, may be helpful in how we um, move forward with this. That was good, Carrie. <laughs> well, I just want to follow up on Carrie's point. I mean, I think we received a number of emails from others, but maybe to have a few people come first and speak to us about their experience. And Thoughts about that. I, I would support that. I think we might have some coming. Okay. Um, but we can certainly. But we have had emails. Excuse me? Emails. Yes. yes. At least before the touchers. So 
in that instance, when it's being used the way it's supposed to be used, it's not being wasted, um, do people always take the bullets out of the the no. yeah. Well, I think this is a problem for me. Um, <laughs> I, either we shouldn't use the bullets that are have lead in them, or if or people can use whatever bullets they want, but they should always take the bullets out and not leave them out there because. So I would like to hear, if we're going to go further with this, I would like to hear bullet testimony. What kinds of bullets there are, what happens to the bullets, et cetera. I think I can help you with that. So my go-to gun is my 30 i 6 Lead bullet, lead core, the whole thing, pass through. My gun has pass through shots. So that means it goes entirely through the end. There's, if it hits, if it hits bone, generally it just smashes right through it. So you'll never see your bullet. So I never see it ever. When I process my animals, I never see it. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. What's the cost difference between that and a bullet that would do no harm to animals, uh, other scavengers? So, but there are some bullets that people use that do kind of fragment. In lower caliber guns, they will use them. Like 22 caliber guns are notorious for fragmenting. So when they hit a bone, they tumble and fragment. So, you know, lower caliber guns are noted for that. So that is a true statement that they do fragment. Okay. So, how much are the less expensive items? So, right now, no really, way. all ammunition is expensive, no matter what, because the federal government has <laughs> stepped in and most. Well, if you don't reload yourself, then you're paying a high dollar for all ammunition, whether it's trap loads to 30 odd six shells to nine millimeter. They're all very expensive. That, that's a pretty simple question to answer that we can right. go yeah. online and look at. So let's keep the conversation going. Representative McCullough? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking that for myself, I would like to see this bill actually make, make it through crossover, which would mean we vote it out uh, Friday afternoon and give it to the clerk. Um, having said that, I think it is important um, that, that we, we find um, some number, two, three, four, we can get six, six, who can come in here um, at the commissioner's behest, uh, who are hunters, um, to say whatever it is they've got to say in a time period that we can that we can allot to this, so this committee can hear um, hunters who have heretofore been absent, either in email or in person, to tell us, I'm I'm a I'm a hunter. And I'm from a hunting traditions family, and I think this one waste bill is uh, not important. It's this, that, or the other. Um, and if anybody can find these people, maybe uh, Representative Bates could, maybe the commissioner could. But I would like to get them in here, and, and, and if we have an opportunity on our schedule to do that on um, Thursday or Friday, and then consider what they've got to say, um, and then make our decision based on all the evidence. I would like, I would like to do that. If we can't do that this week, then oh well, it doesn't make the crossover. But we still probably, um, no, we still should, if they're available, hear their, those people's testimony. And and so then, um, according to the commissioner. Uh, would be reasonable uh, from the chair and uh, Representative Bates just heard my request. Um, you might be able to find a half dozen people for us to come in and say that. Uh, or even if you could get one, <laughs> that would be good. All right. I'd like to make one statement if I may. Yes. I, I find it utterly amazing that we so readily condone 
aborting babies and voted on it and passed it out and yet we don't want to kill a goddamn coyote. Amazes me. That's all I have to say. All right. So what I've heard is that we would like to take more, take some testimony from some hunters, um, hunters who might help us with the language, hunters who might not be supportive of it. Um, and how do others feel about trying to make crossover? I, I know, I'm not, I, I won't care one way or the other what we make, because we make crossover. I just think that, that there may have to be some wording changes in this bill, and if maybe we won't find it. Maybe there's nobody out there that's close to this bill. I don't know, but I just think that if there is someone, we should at least listen to them. If we don't make crossover, we don't make crossover. Okay, so we, you have a couple names? That yes, you can I think there were two out of them. Okay. I can probably get one too. Okay, can you send those along to me and Laura, please? Yep. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Um, we are adjourned until tomorrow morning.